So I see that everyone has taken a seat. We all look happy. Gumoron, good morning. Ovelkommen. That's all of the Swedish I'll, I'll say today. Um, welcome here in the Museum of Ethnography in beautiful Stockholm. We're here for the Swedish presidency event. So Sweden will hold the seat of the Council of Europe for the first six months of this year. And so we're here to honor that. And more importantly, talk about a few very important topics in cultural heritage that we want to highlight today. We have a jam-packed day full of speakers, panels, discussions. So um, I'm looking forward to taking you on that journey um, with me. I'm Jolan Wurtz. I'll be your moderator for today. Um, I work uh, at Europeana, and I have done so for the past five years. Um, I'm not an expert in 3D, but luckily a lot of 3D experts are here in the room today and they will be able to um, hopefully answer the question why 3D matters, why is it important in cultural heritage? That, most, that is mostly the, um, the question we want answered here and we'll be talking about throughout the day. So as I already said, this is a hybrid event. So we have people joining us online, we have people joining us physically, that means for q and I'll be asking some questions that come in online, and we have some colleagues online that will help me with that. So thank you, Liana, and people online that will be supporting us here. Um, if you have questions in the room, of course, please raise your hand when it's time for Q&A, and you'll be able to ask your question as well. So we during the uh, presentations itself, this is mostly for online, we'll try to keep our interaction to a minimum and we ask you to do the same. Uh, we'll post some links, but uh, please just, you know, sit, listen actively, and then during Q&A sessions, we'll uh, open up the floor. I also want to make sure that you know that when you leave uh, the Zoom room today, there will be a quick pop-up survey. We, it takes just a few minutes, it has a few questions, and it helps us improve our hybrid events and make sure that we know what we did well and what can be improved. So please take your time to answer that survey. Right, so we're here for this long title, Accelerating 3D in the Common European Data Space for Cultural Heritage. For me, the subtitle is more important, Why 3D Matters. I felt a little bit of this question yesterday. Um, we had a wonderful day out organized by the Ministry of Culture uh, in collaboration with the Swedish National Heritage Board, which ended in a Viking restaurant um, yesterday evening, which was uh, quite an experience. Uh, I really loved being there, and I know a lot of you were there as well. Um, for those of you who weren't there, I want you to imagine coming into a dimly lit wooden room where, lit by candles that are on these massive wooden tables and in wall sconces. You get um, introduced into the room by a loud horn blaring by a Viking man that then loudly introduces you and announces you to the rest of the guests there. Um, there's a boat that has been rigged up to the ceiling, and when you go and sit down, you get um, served heaping servings of clams and venison and deer. Um, that I, I'd never experienced anything like this before, but I really felt, even though it maybe was a bit of a more touristy and not very historically accurate version, I think, of the Viking era, I did feel immersed in this kind of uh, culture and history that uh, we can't have anymore or that doesn't exist anymore today. I also tried to find a horn between last evening and today to announce all of the speakers, but uh, couldn't find one in time. So I'll have to introduce you in a more boring way. I'm sorry. Um, it, it's this kind of possibility of immersion that for me is one of the great opportunities of digitizing cultural heritage in 3D. Um, we might be able to have a conference like this in VR in a Viking hall that has been digitized, um, but we can also you know, preserve monuments that uh, maybe are at risk of being lost due to war or climate change. Um, there's all of these really exciting opportunities, but we need to take all of these cultural heritage institutions along with us on that journey. I think this journey mostly can start today with the answer to that question, why 3D matters. So I am looking forward to hearing the answer to that question from everyone here today. 
Right, I'll stop talking now and I'll introduce our first speaker, which is uh, Sophia Lauren. I couldn't think of anyone better to start the day. Um, she is the Ministry or the Director General of the Ministry of Culture here in Sweden. Um, she's head of the Division for Cultural, uh, for Cultural and Cultural Environment, and she'll open up the day for us. So, uh, Sophia, uh, the floor is yours. Please help me in welcoming Sophia. Thank you, and good morning to you all. You're all very welcome to this event during the Swedish presidency. Regardless whether you are here at the Ethn Ethnographical Museum in Stockholm or participate online. I'm honored by the opportunity to present this keynote and send this conference on its way. I'd like to start with sending the best regards and wishes for a successful conference from the minister, Swedish Minister of Culture, Parisa Liljestrand. She regrets that she does not have the opportunity to be here today. Any given year, the requests for the presence of the Swedish Minister of Culture are many and not less during a presidency. Historically, in Sweden, the motives for digitizing and using digital cultural heritage have changed over the decades. Along with it, the interest in digital cultural heritage from the public authorities have also, also changed. I imagine the same development, development can be seen in most of your countries. Some 50 years ago, Swedish cultural heritage institutions started to wonder if computers could be a way forward in getting better control over the large collections. They learned by doing and tailored the system to their own internal needs. The interest from the public authorities in these early days, if any, were purely fiscal as the collections represent huge values. 25 years later, the government argued that collection database should be published on the internet. Now collection information no longer was considered strictly an internal concern. The information should also benefit the public, other cultural heritage institutions, research, education, and more. Today, the same can be said about public information in general. Open access is a key word. About 10 years ago, the idea arose that cross-border, cross-sector searches into the wealth of European cultural heritage information should be possible when more and more was available online. In 2008, the European Commission put forward a recommendation to the member states and the flagship project we know as Europeana was launched. As a result of their recommendation, the Swedish government in 2011 decided on a national strategy for digital cultural heritage. I led that work and I'm very proud to note that Sweden today is one of the larger providers of digital objects in Europeana. As Sweden has very high ambitions in its national digital strategy, I'm hopeful that this will continue to be the case. I think the importance of digital cultural heritage for society has never been more recognized than it is today. By transforming Europeana from a platform to a data space, digital cultural heritage will be a part of a common data market and can, among other things, be used in tourism application or in educational material. Not the least will the data space be able to provide raw material to the cultural and creative industries, a sector that is of growing importance to the European economy. The setup of European cloud for digital cultural heritage will provide new opportunities for research. Just around the corner awaits initiatives relating to metaverse and other virtual environments. The list could go on. When I talk to representatives from the cultural heritage institution, the primary issue is often needs for funds. But a real concern today is also access to the right competence as the demand for digital competence is high in all society. 
participating in professional networks and conference like this today is what is therefore of great importance for those working with digital cultural heritage. And on that note, I wish you all a fruitful day. Thank you so much, Sophia. A lot of important keywords, I think, were mentioned by you, uh, like open access, I think, was a very uh, nice one to drop at the start of the day, and I hope we can come back to that a few times. Uh, also, the metaverse, I heard, which I I'm sure we can have a lot of discussions about as well. Um, before we go to the next speaker, I will just see if people online are doing okay, and if there are any questions. Um, but I think we are fine there. So I will go ahead and introduce our next speaker um, who is online. I hope Rehana is uh, there online to do her uh, keynote. Uh, we'll listen to Rehana Schwillinger Ladakh, who is uh, since 2018 the head of DigiConnect, which uh, stands for the unit Interactive Technologies Digital for Culture and Education. Uh, luckily, DigiConnect is a, uh, an easier uh, term to say. Welcome, Renahana. You are up on screen. Uh, I will give the floor to you. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, where are you calling in from today? Good morning. A very warm welcome from Luxembourg. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Thank you. I'll oh, give the floor super. to you. And uh, please go ahead, Renahana. Thank you. I see myself with a, on a huge screen. It's a bit unsettling, but that's fine. <laughs> So uh, a very good morning to all of you. It's, it's my pleasure to be addressing to you remotely uh, at this European Air Conference. And I would like to thank uh, all of you, starting by our very gracious Swedish hosts. As we say, Tak Sa Miket. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it rightly, but uh, please bear with me. And also thank you to the organizers, to the European Air Foundation team, and to all of you attendees, experts, representative, enthusiasts, leaders of the European Air Initiative and the Data Space for Cultural Heritage. Maybe it's because I've been spending these past days during Easter break walking in a forest, which is always conducive to some sort of reflection, that I also see our European cultural heritage as a forest with deep roots, extraordinarily diverse, yet intrinsically linked, strong, vast, and giving us air to breathe. Remember three years ago uh, when after months of confinement and closure, we could finally go back to visiting museums, galleries, archives, and enjoying our cherished monuments. That was like oxygen to us. Also, like a forest, the beloved monuments, site, artifacts are increasingly exposed to many risks, natural and man-made, climate change and war. War, which we did not think could happen anymore on our continent. And with this, I have a special thought for our Ukrainian colleagues still fighting courageously. So needless to say, and I'm speaking here to the converted, we need not only to preserve, but to accelerate the preservation of our cultural heritage, which obviously means also preserving it digitally. The thing is, le still less than 20% of the collections in our museums, archives, galleries and libraries are digitized. And it's even worse for sites and monuments, even those at risk. We cannot repeat this often enough. And on the other hand, not preserving cultural heritage and not doing it now means exposing it, exposing it to all uh, those risks with a double cost, which is the cost of ignoring the risk and hoping for the best, and this is not working. And second, the cost of catching up in advanced technologies after long period of idleness. So the theme of this conference is about 3D technologies. These do not diminish the merit of other technologies such as enhanced 2D, but 3D does bring significant added value for digitization, for digital preservation, for enhanced access and for reuse in many ways. And there are just so many possibilities such as adding narratives and stories to a 3D model, the stories of what a building was built for, the intangible heritage it is linked to, 
or such as applying artificial intelligence in enriching, enriching and getting more languages in the 3D model descriptions and metadata, or such as using 3D models to construct cultural virtual world or metaverses, as we just mentioned them. So beyond highlighting choosing 3D in our overarching policy framework, which is the recommendation for a common European data space, we also aspired at an ambition, a collective ambition and responsibility, which is why we've put this forward, these targets, that by 2030, we want every single monument and site deemed at risk by member states to be digitized in 3D, as well as at least 50% of the most visited ones, because those are also at risk. And this was already one year and a half ago, time flies. So next year, we'll be evaluating the outcomes and the progress uh, of member states in relation to the recommendation for the first time. And we have a lot to do, a lot of difficult questions to address such as what to choose, what do we digitize? And I wonder, for instance, as we are in Sweden, what would be the most pressing monuments to digitize in 3D, for example? Is it the most ancient site, like Iron Age tombs or Stone Age settlements? Is it the most intricate one, like the Kalmar Castle, that would generate the most vertices? Is it the most beloved and visited that would need to stop ticket selling during some days for digitizing? Is it the most reflective with many windows that would make it harder for scanners like the turning torso in Malmo? You can see both the Kalma castle and the turning torso in beautiful images as virtual background and the these come from Europeana. So each and every site, every artifact, every monument, every item is a challenge in itself. Yet, likely the most difficult might be the first one. So my message here is do not wait for the perfect technology to embrace 3D digitization to do it. There is no ChatGPT drone scan for that. Do not wait for everyone to have all the digital skills perfectly mastered as, may, as many of the skills will only be acquired while doing it. Waiting will only result in being too late. 3D is more affordable than ever, or if you prefer, it is as affordable as it will ever be. So start with something that is at high risk, something you cannot afford your grandchildren to miss, something that matters, to use the word of this conference, something you want to share with the rest of Europe, with the rest of the world. And you're not on your own in this endeavor. You have a community around you to support you through collaboration. This is what the initiative is about, learning from each other, growing through each other and with each other. And Sophia mentioned that previously. And at the Commission, we are very happy to facilitate this collaboration by expanding the European ecosystem, first by nurturing it and growing it as a data space for cultural, cultural heritage, by creating links with national data spaces and other European data spaces who have a lot to learn from the cultural heritage data space. We also have the expertise of the 4CH project, which is present in this conference, which will later become the competence center for the conservation of cultural heritage and be able to assist cultural heritage institutions in their technical endeavors. We have new projects that have started and that will enrich the data space. There will be other future opportunities for new projects. Sophia mentioned the lack of funding. We are trying to address this issue of funding. And there is also a toolbox because funding is not the only thing. There are also a number of ways of helping uh, cultural heritage institutions. So we have some easy to use tools such as the study on 3D, the task force on 3D, the guidelines on 3D that we uh, published two years ago to help you get started. Because the main thing is to get started. And with this, I will leave you and encourage you to collaborate with everyone. There is a lot of expertise in the room and in the virtual room. And what I would like to say is that you can count on us, on the Commission, to be at your side along the way. And with this, I thank you and I wish you a very fruitful conference. Back to you.
Thank you so much, Rihanna, for those inspiring words. Um, I have a question or two for you, if that is uh, okay, before we uh, move on. Um, first, fine. something that, that, that came to my mind while you were speaking, you were talking about the connection between 3D digitization and the data space for cultural heritage, and also the connection to other data spaces within, uh, within Europe. Um, I was wondering if you already have in mind what other data spaces, for instance, would have a great opportunity to connect with the data space for cultural heritage. Which ones should we be looking to, or is this more of a, a mesh of integrating with all data spaces that exist? Yeah, thank you. That that's a very interesting, a very useful uh, uh, question because uh, in my unit we also support the data space for tourism, and obviously tourism and cultural heritage are very much linked. So we have uh, project two projects that are preparing a blueprint for the data space for tourism, and some of the cultural heritage uh, that are part of this initiative are also being interviewed uh, in order to prepare this blueprint. So for me, there are all obvious link as to how we can better valorize what has been digitized in the data space for cultural heritage and the tourism database. How can you inspire future visitors uh, through those, uh, through, through those uh, uh, 3D models? How can you link cultural heritage uh, uh, sites to their uh, uh, plans? How can you make link between cultural heritage sites and other kinds of touristic services? So there are obvious links, and I only see win-win for, for both communities there. Thank you. Um, I have one more question uh, that came in online through Zoom, and thank you um, for asking this. This is maybe a, a bit more of a technical question, so uh, we'll see how far we get. The question is that, for modern buildings, there should be 3D models already. Do you know of any initiatives that um, aid in converting these already digitized monuments to a common and most importantly preservable standard rather than, than scanning it? And I think that maybe here the connection to other data spaces where they have done some of this work already might be, might be relevant. Yeah, yeah, indeed there are. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I can answer precisely this question, but indeed there are a number of data spaces, there are a number of, uh, sorry, there are a number of uh, standards that are already uh, community-led. Uh, 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 BIM is one of them used. So uh, the idea is also to see what are the most used uh, standards that we can uh, further uh, promote. And I think that that is going to be one of the work also uh, as part of the progression uh, of standards that we are using in the data space, because one of the work is how do we evolve the frameworks that are currently in place, and that will also include uh, the all the relevant uh, standards here uh, in relation to digitization. Great, thank you so much, uh, Rehana, for joining us online. I hope you stay online to enjoy some of the other talks we'll have today, and uh, I hope the weather in Luxembourg is as good as it is here, because we have uh, amazing Swedish weather. I was prepared for snow and blizzards, but um, that I think is my preconception of what Sweden is like. Uh, we'll move on to our next speaker, which is uh, Joachim Malmström. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, he's National Antiquarian and the Director General for the Swedish National Heritage Board. Uh, Joachim, the stage is yours. Thank you. And on behalf of the Swedish National Heritage Board, it is my great honor to welcome you to the warm and sunny Sweden, both physically and, of course, online as well, and express how happy I am to be part of hosting this conference. It is a great opportunity to come together, discuss important matters and build relationships. As individuals working in the cultural heritage field, we understand the significance of our work. Unfortunately, in society, its importance isn't fully realized only but when we face the most sinister of realities. For instance, when bombs began falling over Ukraine in February last year, a frantic effort to preserve all, all heritage that could be saved was initiated. And sites and monuments are 3D, 3D documented in a pace like never before. 
I've spoken to a lot of colleagues in Ukraine and come to understand the very harsh reality in which they work and operate, and also how fragile our cultural heritage is. The rise of technology, and especially 3D technology, has proven to be extremely useful in saving the knowledge of our heritage and making it possible to study even when it is no longer physically present. It is also possible to use the results within both traditional heritage work, such as utilizing VR and uh, giving more holistic per perspectives on collections, but it can also be used in totally new and unexpected ways. Within the National Heritage Board, we have been worked together with companies driven by innovative ideas on how cultural heritage can be used in collaboration between businesses and cultural heritage institutions. Two years ago, the National Heritage Board made a 3D model of the medieval castle, very famous medieval castle, Glimminge Hus, that has been extensively used uh, by schools around the entire country. And as a matter of fact, even though there are no uh, restrictions from the pandemic, in effect, the number of uh, digital visitors keep growing. From the Swedish National Heritage, Point, uh, Heritage Board point of view, we want to step forward and drive the digital transformation and collectively take action within the cultural heritage sector. We have made this one of our top priorities for the past two years and looking on into the future. And for instance, this year in close collaboration with the major national museums in Sweden, we have launched a project aimed at developing skills that will be uh, very helpful in the digital transformation of the entire museum sector in Sweden, which is generally generously funded by the European Social Fund. It has three levels, uh, building basic digital skills for all museum employees, specialist trainings for professionals in areas such as collection management and digitization, and also very important uh, to strengthen leadership within the digital transformation. Very exciting project that we have launched. And we aim to make this the first of many steps and are eager to further develop our uh, contribution to the European digital heritage. Within the digital world, traditional geographical or political boundaries does not exist and grants new op opportunities for collaboration. And the technology avail available today almost, uh, offers almost unlimited possibilities. But I think it's essential to have a sustainable and a long-term vision to ensure its effective use. We need to ask ourselves what relevant, uh, relevance our work has today and in the future, and how we can ex ensure accessibility and relevance for upcoming generations. It is important to ensure that the work that we are doing today will be useful in the future and that it can be easily found, accessed and shared across multiple platforms. And I think by collaborating across borders, we can work together to ensure that our cultural heritage is preserved and made available for future generations to appreciate and learn from. I'm honored to be here today in the presence of individuals that share our passion for cultural heritage. And I hope that this conference will be a good opportunity to learn from one, one another and build lasting relationships and pay way for an even brighter future for our common heritage. Thank you for participating and again a warm welcome to sunny Sweden. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joachim. Sunny Sweden, indeed. There was one short question I wanted to ask you. You can sit down or, or come back to the stage if you'd like. Um, Rehana posed this question for us, basically, that we have to start somewhere when digitizing. You already gave the example of uh, some digitization of, of important heritage sites that you did a few years ago. Um, do you have in mind what the next place would be that you would love to have digitized? Would it be this, this very modern building or an old heritage site? What for you is the next, the next building that we really need to have in 3D? 
Now that's an interesting question. I think it should be posted together with the entire museum sector. These are some of the topics that we are discussing, especially in light of the destruction of cultural heritage in Ukraine. What sites in Sweden do we need to focus our attention to when it comes to 3D uh, modeling? Vasa Museum, of course, for <laughs> instance, but there are there are a lot of important places mm. that we need to focus on. I think we have to discuss that, this collectively within the, the sector to decide where to focus our priorities okay. first. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for the, for, for the sector together to right. decide on. I'll remember the Vasa Museum mostly. <laughs> um, and maybe the same question can be posed in a bit to uh, the next speaker, who is Anfolin. Um, Anfolin is director of the National Museums of world culture, which consists of four museums, not just the Museum of Ethnography, which we're in today, but also the Museum of Mediterranean and Near Eastern Antiquities, the Museum of Far Eastern Antiquities, and the Museum of World Cultural in Gothenburg. So you have a big view of cultural heritage in Sweden. Unfolding the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. And a huge collection, I would say. I would also like to say welcome to both the National Museums of World Culture, but also to this, specifically this museum, Museum of Ethnography. We're so happy to host this conference. And a few words to connect to the topic of today's conference. We are working through uh, many of the same challenges as European museum and cultural institutions face when they work working with 3D digitalization, capturing data across a range of cultural material diverse in form, scale, and texture, efficiently scaling 3D digitalization, storing, managing, and sharing the resulting data, following fair data management principles, and making 3D digital content available to visitors in ways that enrich those, these encounters. Along with two other uh, Swedish cultural institutions, Arctas, and the National Swedish Museums of History, Military History, and a partner at the National uh, Heritage, Swedish National Heritage Board, we are looking forward to accelerating this work over the coming years as a testbed for a digital upskilling program designed to better, um, to create better conditions to activate, co-create, and to help users explore our collections digitally. As Museum of World Culture, we are particularly excited about the potential of 3D digitalization to develop both new and existing relationships with the global communities from which the museum's collections are sourced. 3D digital content has the potential to bridge both geographical and institutional distances between the collection that we care for here in Sweden and a variety of users and the descendant cultural communities around the world. And to be honest, the main part of our visitors and stakeholders will probably never be able to come and visit us physically in person, only online. And that is a reality that makes the work of providing high quality digital content even more important. 3D models, uh, modeling facilitates and help inter international collaboration to identify items that have been fragmented, destroyed, as we heard, in time of war, uh, not least, and are subject also to illicit trafficking of cultural heritage. Within a, frame, within a framework in which World Culture Museum and Naturographic Museum seek to decolonize their working practices through co-creation and shared stewardship of collections. We are mindful of the need for ethical cautionness around the digitalization of culturally sensitive objects. In some cases, tensions exist between copyright frameworks, the requirement to make collections research publicly available and cultural codes specific to individual source communities surrounding how and with whom culturally and spiritually sensitive knowledge should be shared. As we seek to make digital versions of museum collections more widely spread and available, we must be very careful to navigate such tensions in an ethical and respectful manner. Another use of 3Ds are in that 
become maybe more relevant is when returning objects to countries of origin uh, and is to enable the institutions to keep a digital copy uh, if the source communities allows that. As an organization with culture stakeholders around the world, we must also be mindful of the limitation of technology in the developing countries and aim to digitally meet people uh, through locally available technologies. Right now, we are putting the final touches to a new exhibition called We Are Sedgic. This is part of the Creative Europe, Europe project taking care and members from the Sajik Taiwanese indigenous group and a team from our museum uh, have created an innovation exhibition and an upcoming digital platform. Uh, using new technology, this exhibition shows how museum collection can be highly relevant and used to both return, reuse, regain and recreate knowledge at risk of being lost. And our curatorial team, they are ready and eager to give you a preview later this afternoon. So I would just say that we are extremely proud to be hosting this conference. And we're also looking forward for everything uh, to learn and to get inspired by from those brilliant speakers that are at the list. So thank you. Welcome. <laughs> to, 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 to. Thanks Thank you so much. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so Thanks much. So much. Um, uh, I am hearing myself, but not anymore now. Great. I'm very curious to learn more about the We Are Cedric uh, exhibition later today. Um, next in our row of introductions, we have Eva Stengod, who has a storied history of uh, digital cultural heritage in Sweden. She is the special advisor to the Ministry of Culture, and she represents Sweden in the European Commission Expert Group, CEDHE. -C uh, Eva, please go ahead. Thank you very much. 3D, suddenly it's on all, everybody's lips. Uh, and also in the focus of the latest recommendation from the European Commission. Uh, and I'm sure that for many of us, the fire in Notre Dame was a wake up call, reminding us of the need of good do documentation uh, of cultural heritage. And also in the aftermath of the fire, not the least highlighting the, the role 3D can having restoration of the event of a sudden disaster but also as we heard from rihanna the need to document cultural heritage at risk from being lost forever for instance as a result of the climate changes another more grim and recent reminder is of course the ongoing war in ukraine as you will hear later today the potential use of 3d is object goes beyond the documentation of an extent to research, education, research, reuse, for, in, for instance, the gaming industries and more. And as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, the cultural heritage institutions have in earnest begun to explore the possibilities of different digital programs and services, among them 3D applications and how they can attract new audiences or provide access to cultural heritage difficult or maybe poss impossible to access in person. Um, but many questions arise on formats, gear and software and when starting a 3D project. A lot of decisions must be made that will impact the final quality and also not to mention the costs. And these decisions have always been relevant in the digitization project, but are perhaps more, even more so in 3D projects. So learning um, from the experiences of others is, as always, a good way to um, start. And I must say these regular Europeana conferences uh, are an excellent way to be inspired. Uh, exchange good practices, build competencies, and extend our professional networks. And with those few words, I'd like to yield the floor to Harry Verbeggen from the Europeana Foundation. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva. Uh, and thank you for partly doing my work for me. Last but very much not least uh, in our row of welcomes today is Hari Verwein. He's the Director General of Europeana, and he wears the Ring of Vikings. <laughs> Harry, go ahead. And this should be much better. Yes, thank you. Um, there we go. This works as well. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'd like to start with thanking uh, the Ministry, uh, the Swedish Heritage Board, and not in the least, uh, the Museum of Ethnography for hosting us so kindly. Uh, it's a great privilege uh, to be here in Stockholm today uh, in such a, an eminent president and uh, both here physically and online uh, today. Um, yes, to start this welcome and to kick you off for today, um, I'd like to uh, say a few things about 3D. And I'd like to zoom in on one question that I get asked all the time uh, by the people who are working in our network. Okay, 3D, um, I can sort of understand that that's relevant, but how is that relevant to me uh, as a librarian, as an archivist, uh, who perhaps do not have uh, much 3D material to share? Uh, tell us a bit about that. And while you're at it, perhaps you can also tell us a bit about the relationship between Europeana and this data space story. So let me toggle you back to 2005. Uh, in 2005, we had an antagonist uh, in the form of Google. I don't know uh, if you still remember. I know um, the, the ministry uh, does because you were here uh, at the time. Uh, Google proposed to digitize everything that we had here in Europe uh, uh, at no cost. Uh, we'd make it available uh, on their servers, and there was just this little catch. Uh, all of our cultural heritage would be in the hands of one private uh, entity. And the European Commission at the time uh, stepped in and uh, decided that this was way too important. If this thing works, um, can somebody? Um, it is. Yes. It did work a minute ago. Is there something you can do over there to flip it? There you go. Right. I'm going to rely on you tomorrow. Um, the European Commission and the sector, the community, stepped in and said, this is something that we want to at least co-own. We want to be organizing this ourselves on the basis of certain principles and values that we hold dear. Values like sovereignty, open principles that have been referred to before, and interoperability. This material needs to become available for everyone, uh, for enjoyment, for commercial repurposes, and so forth. And so it happened that between 2008 and 2022, next slide please, Tamara, um, we've been able to work with the sector, with 4,000 museums, libraries, archives in Europe, uh, to aggregate 56 million and some uh, objects. We've created the largest database of cultural heritage objects in Europe together, based on interoperable and open principles. I think that's an achievement, and we can be proud of that. Next slide, please. Um, we've been working uh, through uh, the relationships that we have, uh, amongst others, the, the Swedish National Heritage Board, SOC, the aggregator of Swedish uh, cultural heritage material uh, through Europeana. And it is through those partnerships that we've been able to grow uh, this network and this ecosystem of organizations that make this material available. And we're greatly thankful for that. And have the next slide, uh, I'll show you uh, how fantastic a partner Sweden is to uh, the European endeavor. Uh, we've got four and a half million objects relating to Sweden and from Sweden in the database. And we've been able to intermix that with other material related to Sweden, uh, but coming uh, from other institutions across Europe. So that creates a very rich palette of uh, heritage. Uh, 
Uh, the quality of the material, tier four, is the highest kind of quality that we have in Europeana. It's both uh, technical quality is high and it's also as open uh, as, it, uh, as it can be. Uh, Sweden is one of the leading uh, countries in Europe. In the next slide, you'll see that uh, it's also uh, a pro protagonist of open, 71% uh, almost three quarters of the material you've provided uh, to, to Europe and to the world is uh, reusable. And that I think is a very, very important component of uh, the work that we've been doing. And this, of course, is the Museum of Ethnography. I've shown uh, a quick slide. 268,000 objects from your museum are also part of the Europeana database, and that's fantastic. Next slide, please. Um, actually, before I get into this, this is going to go deeper, I'd like to uh, come back to the reference to uh, that illustrious night last night. I've been bestowed with a great honor. Uh, I've been given a Viking ring by the Swedish National Heritage Board. And I understand this, that this is a little bit of play, but also a renewment of our alliance to continue this fantastic work in the future and get more Swedish material into Europeana and the connection. Am I right? Of course, great. I'll wear this with great pride. Um, so why did we bring all this material together? I think it's important to also uh, you know, spend some time on that as well. So we've been able to make that data available through a variety of APIs, which are accessible for everyone, uh, websites, social media, and so forth, so that we can reach researchers, creatives, uh, educators, and so forth. And I'll give you a few examples. In the next slide, you'll see something uh, that I... Uh, can I have the next slide, please, Tamar? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Next slide. This one is just a website. This is an example, a small example, petite histoire, they call that in France, uh, of uh, where we can make uh, interconnections and where cultural heritage really relates to identity. So what you see here is uh, uh, a drawing from a relatively famous uh, artist uh, from Sweden, Gustav Brandelius, who happens to be the great, great grandfather of a woman called Stephanie, who uh, got in touch with us uh, via Instagram and found out that uh, material from her father, uh, artworks from her father, are available in Europeana. And she shares this on her uh, Instagram account, is very pleased with the fact that uh, her personal history is also part of the European history. And I think it's these little things that make me, uh, make me happy and proud, proud to be working in this environment. It's not always about you know, big companies and unicorns. It's about these kinds of stories that, that make, us, uh, make us happy. So it's about common people that have access to this material. In the next slide, you'll see that uh, Europeana is also seen by graphical artists, very often smaller, smaller organizations, one or two people, uh, who use Europeana because we have a very large amount of copyright-free material that they can freely reuse in their, in their artworks. You see that in the next slide, uh, educators use uh, our material. In this case, uh, an art teacher in Catalonia who's been using uh, our database to uh, work with their students. And also in the next slide, Tamara, uh, researchers um, like this one uh, from Belgium who've been using our APIs to create collages uh, based, uh, that, that she uses for her research on, um, in the digital humanities. So this is just to give you an impression of the kinds of things that we can do if we join up forces, make our material available in interoperable formats and openly. So where does that leave us? In the next slide, um, Europeana uh, is more than a database. We're a community. Uh, that means that in the next slide, uh, we are able to address the things and the themes that are relevant to us today. That includes things like climate action. We have a responsibility there and a role to play. That includes uh, things like AI, very much a hot topic at the moment. How does that relate to our sector? That's the kinds of things that we need to address together. In the next slide, <clears throat> yes, you'll see um, 
how we see ourselves as part of this data space that you may have been hearing of. Uh, we see the data space as a great opportunity. It's uh, a term from computer sciences. It's a, uh, a method to make data sharing interoperable across, uh, across Europe uh, to support a digital single market. It builds on Europeana, but it's an expansion of the work we do. That's how we like to see the data space. So it allows us in the next version, Tamara, to deal with other types of data that we may not have been able to work with before. It will allow us to think about what kind of other services we can make available that uh, are relevant to the digital cultural heritage sector of the future, but are not yet part of our palette. Um, and ultimately, uh, we need to start thinking hard and fast about uh, new methods of making data available in virtual environments such as the metaverse. And that is, Joran, where 3D comes in, right? So I'd like to leave it at this. I hope you have a very inspiring and, and useful day. This is complicated matter, but I'm sure that we're in the right setting here to, uh, to be able to deal with this. So thank you, and Joran, I'll be handing back to you. Lovely, thank you so much. Thanks again, Harry. Um, now we can, uh, after all of these welcomes, these introductions by people, and thank you for every, to everyone who has spoken this morning, we'll indulge in a, another part of important Swedish cultural heritage, which is the Fika. Uh, so I invite all of you uh, in the room next to this one uh, called Matmeka to have our little Fika break. Uh, to the people online, we'll be uh, having a break for about 15 minutes. We'll reconvene here at five past 10, where we'll see some uh, interesting use cases of cultural heritage and 3D. Thank you, and see you at five past 10. A work day can be long, exhausting, and sometimes even downright dull. But fortunately, for Swedes, there is always a small little holiday coming up. At least twice a day, every day. Fika comes in many forms. From a cup of coffee and a dammsugare outside in the spring sun, to a kanelbulle when you're shopping for car parts at Biltema, to the everyday micro breaks with a mazarin when discussing a project. But most sacred is the fika stund at 9.30 and 14.30 when you meet colleagues over small kakor in the fika room. All in all, fika is much more than a coffee break. It's a necessity of life. I hope you enjoyed your fika. Um... It smells amazing when you step outside. It's this waft of uh, cinnamon, cinnamon rolls, so that's great. The first fika of a few, so if you didn't get your fika fix, there will be more later today. So welcome back. Uh, thanks everyone for being here again. If you're just joining us online, thank you for being online. I also want to mention that we are recording this meeting. Uh, just for your knowledge, it should have also have said so in a pop-up when you entered the Zoom chat. Um, again, it would be great if you could use your first and last name in Zoom so that when you ask questions, we know who asked the question and we can mention you um, here live today. So now we'll be talking a bit more in depth on 3D, why it matters, why it's important. We'll start with a short introduction by Valentin, who is Data Services Director at Europeana. You've been working there since 2009. So she has deep knowledge and expertise. Valentin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yola. Good morning, everyone. So yeah, now time to get into the, the deep of the, the program. Huh? So we are, we are starting. So, 
when we, we prepared the program for, for this event, so we knew we wanted to, to talk about 3D, um, and we didn't want to do it just for the sake of it. So the idea was indeed to explain why 3D matters, and I think you have already heard a lot about this uh, today with some, uh, some uh, practical, concrete examples that shows why uh, it's important to accelerate on uh, 3D digitization. But we also wanted to show you what opportunities it, uh, it provides. And, uh, and in this regard, um, the uh, European has the stewards of the common, uh, the common European data space for cultural heritage is there to support you in, uh, in, uh, in this effort. So, what are the key messages uh, when it comes to working on, uh, on 3D? So, first, uh, 3D, okay. <laughs> 3, 3D really challenges the way we think about access. And this is where uh, it provides opportunity to think about how we can reach um, audiences in a new way, but also new type of audi audiences, both online, but also in, in, the in the physical environment, because you will see today uh, 3D can be used in a physical environment, like in an exhibition, in a museum. So there are many new uh, use cases uh, that, uh, that can be used with, uh, with 3D. And of course, um, so we will show you today some, uh, some example of this, and also uh, showing you how, uh, in this case, training and uh, capacity building around 3D is important to make sure that we provide access to those uh, new type of, uh, of material. Then uh, it's about preservation. So 3D allows the conservation of heritage assets in a non-destructive way. Um, and, and this is um, the best, the key message is to respond to the threats that, uh, that have been mentioned today, whether it's climate, cha uh, climate changes, uh, conflicts, uh, also human errors. I mean, uh, with, in the case of Notre Dame, some people are still wondering whether human factor and the way we take care of our cultural heritage was not, uh, was not part of the issue uh, as well. So this is preservation. So of course today, a lot of presen presentations are going to speak about um, how you should digitize um, monuments and set. I mean, how should you should perform 3D digitization, what kind of metadata you should create together with, uh, with this content, because the objective is indeed to preserve uh, those, uh, those monuments. Um, and we will also show you that, in fact, the diversity of the 3D that we, can, um, we have in mind is quite diverse. So um, it's about monument and site, as uh, many examples have been mentioned today. But it can be also smaller objects, uh, museum objects. Um, so, this is what we will also show you, uh, show you today. Um, and then the last aspect is reuse. Um, 3D can enhance reuse through new innovative and creative experiences. And it also allows the cultural heritage sector to collaborate with more diverse actors. So uh, it was mentioned today, collaborating with other data spaces around tourism, for example. Education is also a sector that uh, where 3D can be an element of, uh, of collaboration, but also other sectors, uh, such as industry. Uh, 3D is, being, is used in other sectors, uh, like architecture, civil engineering. So 3D also offers new opportunities for slightly different collaboration um, uh, that can be, uh, can be interesting. So today we will also have some examples on, on, on reuse in, a, in, a, in, a, in different sectors. And also what we wanted to, to leave you with was not only inspiration, but also some practical knowledge. So today you will have also a sessions that will dive in even further into, into 3D, making you familiar with the words that are used when you speak about 3D, some techni technical elements so that as the end of, at the end of the day, you can leave. <coughs> you can leave with all the key at hand and, uh, and start, uh, start working. So I hope you will enjoy the program we built uh, for you, that it will leave you inspired, uh, but also um, that you will see the opportunities that are offered to you and that you will feel ready at the end of the day to engage with 3D activities and, uh, and start the work um, with us also together. Um, so yeah, enjoy, thank you.
auntie uh, as you said a few practical uh, implementations of 3d is exactly what we'll see um, i think we've had a lot of inspiration in the introduction about why 3d matters I think it would be really great to kind of dive a bit deeper into how have people worked on 3D, um, what are some really good examples and use cases. So we will have a few um, online presentations uh, that have been pre-recorded, but as I understand it, the speakers are also online in Zoom. So if you have any questions, uh, either in the room or online, uh, please raise your physical hand or put the question in chat. And after the, uh, the recording has finished, we can uh, engage with the speakers and uh, ask them all of the uh, important questions that we have for them. We'll start with a presentation by uh, Alberto Sanchez Vizcaino. Um, his topic is on 3D for the visually impaired. Um, Alberto is professor in prehistory at the uh, Historical Heritage Department of the University of Jaén in Spain, and he's also deputy director of the University Research Institute for Iberian Archaeology. So he is embedded physically and metaphorically in archaeology, uh, mostly in Spain. Before we start the recording, I need to also make sure that you know that this work that he's presenting isn't something he did alone. He did this in a uh, research group and has uh, mostly had the support of Professor Carmen, uh, uh, Dr. Carmen Rueda and Dr. Ana Herans. Um, they aren't speakers, but uh, I think it was important to mention their contribution and their work in this project. So, Alberto, uh, I'm looking forward to your presentation. Good morning. First of all, we'd like to thank you, Diana, and the organizers of this event for their kind invitation to participate in this conference. I'd also like to share the authorship of this presentation with my colleagues, Carmen Rueda and Anna Grant. The proposal that I show you here is the result of teamwork within the framework of the European project 5D culture, deploying and demonstrating a 3D cultural heritage space. The aim of this project is the identification and recovery of a set of 3D models belonging to the field of fashion, archaeology and architecture. This high quality 3D content will fit into the development of several reuse scenarios in the domain of fashion collections, archaeological 3D contents, as well as historic buildings and cityscapes. University Research Institute for Iberian Archaeology participates in the archaeological scenario with an inclusive line of work focused on the reuse of 3D models in the educational context, designing various activities for different educational levels. Our models belong to the culture of the Iberians. They are available in Europeana and they were made in the framework of the European project's 3D icons. The Vivians are one of the most relevant and representative people of the Iron Age and the the 6th and 1st century BC, and they were living in the western part of the peninsula. They are a key people to understand the history of the Iberian Peninsula and the western Mediterranean during the 1st millennium BC. Specifically, 60 3D models from some of the most representative Iberian archaeological sites of the province of Jaén have been selected to update them in Europeana and to prepare diverse educational events. In general, we would like students and people with impairments to receive a more complete historical, inclusive and diverse information and education on archaeological heritage and on the Iberians. In this slide, I show you some of the 3D models as they can be seen in Europeana. And in this case, they are, they are a sculpture from the two of the most important Iberian sites in Spain, Cerrillo Blanco and El Pajarillo.
In this other slide, you can see the 3D models of four stone boats made using photogrammetry. It is necessary to remark that all the 3D models are being evaluated and reprocessed in a format suitable for reuse in each of the selected educational contexts elementary, high school, university, and for people with impairments. Among students and the people with impairments, two groups are of special interest to facilitate their inclusion in the field of archaeological heritage. People with visual impairments and young, ch and young children, specifically students between 6 and 8 years old. For both cases, we have prepared a proposal that we hope to develop, improve or modify throughout the development of the project Fighting Culture. The final step will be the organization of educational events where the value of the 3D models can be put into practice. To reach this final phase and taking into account the set of models available, the work process to obtain and to test a group of 3D models for people with visual impairments would be as follows. First, classification of the models in different categories to show a complete image of the experience. These categories include types of materials, gender, organic character or functionality. Through them, we intend to explain aspects of the life of the Iberian, such as religion, ritual, death, society, gender, clothes, work, or daily life. Second, the selection of the best type of raw material for 3D model printing, considering special properties that allow a better perception, roughness, hardness, and stickiness. And third, modification of the size according to the selected object and its complexity. These three steps will allow the printing of the best and most suitable 3D models. And to complete the learning process, an audio file with a brief, brief explanation will be provided with each model. Throughout this approach, it's important to note that we do not like to limit ourselves to individual pieces, but rather explain complex stories and scenarios using group of 3D models. Considering this general schema of work in our proposal, the classification of the most interesting and potentially printable model for people with visual impairments would be the following. In the category of uh, animate or organic world, we have distinguished between humans and animals. With the humans, in terms, adults and children or young people, both male and female, could be identified. For the group of animals, it would be useful to be able to differentiate between fantastic, wild and domestic animals. Once the main characteristic of these individualized objects have been identified, the goal of our proposal would be to proceed to the identification of the meaning of set of, of models where more complex stories are told. In the lower part of uh, this slide, you can see two examples of 3D models that recount the heroic fights of Iberian aristocrats against a griffin or against a wolf. In the case of the fight against the griffin, I show you the first test of printing the 3D model with a size reduced to 15%. It's very likely that both the size and the type of filament will have to be modified. In the inorganic or inanimate world category, we have differentiated between burial boxes, ceramic, and a third group, 
not yet well defined, made up of models of coins, ornaments, or weapons. In this category, in addition to the individual recognition of if objects, 3D printing makes it, make it possible to highlight the decorative motive present in each objects, either in the form of embossed or painted decoration. In this way, the story that is told in each, in each object, but especially relevant to understand the world of the videos, could be explained. Naturally, the proposal that we present has searched for references and examples of works in the same line. This could be the cases of the spaces and materials adapted for green people in the National Archaeological Museum in Madrid or in the University Museum of Alicante. In both cases, as in other museums, inclusions and universal accessibility have become one of their priorities. Equally important is the help and advice that we, that we hope to get from ONCE, the main Spanish association for blind people. We hope to obtain the necessary collaboration to refine the selection of models and verify their effectiveness. We'd also like to mention, as a part of our projects, the role played by 3D models in the field of the inclusion of children in the archaeological heritage. In this case, we start from a schema simi similar to the one explained above, although adapted to this category, children between 6 and 8 years old. Unlike the case of visual impairment, we already have experience in this field through workshops already carried out. In these workshops, 3D models of bronze, exports, and copies made of ceramics have been used. Finally, we would like to highlight the potential of 3D model as an inclusive tool for people with autism. In this sense, some experiences have already been put into practice in some Spanish museums using images and symbols. In our case, we'd like to explore the effect of 3D model on this group of people. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Alberto. Yes, thank you so much, Alberto. Um, I am in awe of the, the, this uh, crossroads that you work on between inclusivity and 3D digitization. It's really great to see how this can help people with visual impairments, even people uh, on the autism spectrum. Um, I think this is, this is great research you're doing. I think we have time for one question before we move on. Um, are there any questions from the crowd here currently? Otherwise, I have uh, one for you, Alberto. Um, it's really interesting to see this research. Uh, as I understand it, currently you're working on a small subset of uh, 3D models or models that you want to digitize. Do you have in your mind any way that this can be scaled up or is this really something that has to stay in a small kind of curated space? Could this be scaled up to hundreds of items or, or do you think this isn't possible? Sorry, I don't hear clearly your answer, please. Can you repeat? Yes, sure. So the question is if you see any possibility in scaling up your uh, digitization efforts to a larger set of uh, models or if this needs to stay a small curated data set. I think for the moment uh, we are focused on a small collection of 3D models because uh, this way we could discover what type, what type of problems, what type of uh, inconvenience uh, we can find in, in this uh, group. Uh, once we have a clear idea uh, what is most important for, for people with visual impairments, we could include more models following a uh, 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 line more clear uh, according to the, the best selection of 3D models. 
Great, thank you so much for that uh, intervention, Alberto, and thank you for joining us online as well. We'll uh, move on to our next uh, pre-recorded presentation, which is by Franco Nicolucci. Um, Franco is the director of Vast Lab Research uh, in Prato, Italy. Um, his presentation is on something that has been mentioned a few times already, um, the, the tragic war in Ukraine that is going on now um, is the center of his research in the uh, 4CH project and the SUM initiative. Uh, Franco, we will listen to your presentation. Good morning. I am Franco Nicolucci, Chief Technology Officer of the Okay, can you? And this morning I'm here to present you me? the Save Ukraine Monuments Initiative by the project. 4CH is a uh, project to be designing the European Competence Center. Uh, for the preservation of monuments and sites in Europe. And it is developing visual tools such as 3D models, documentation of preservation of monuments, and evaluation uh, tweets and forecasting hazards. It is also creating a network of national nodes. As you remember, uh, one year ago, on the 24th of February 2022, Ukraine was invaded by War in Europe was not in our threat list, probably it was in a one threat list. And there was no time to take preventive actions to safeguard heritage. On this regard, documentation is of paramount importance for restoration and construction, and in the worst case, to witness lost assets. During the, the, the war, there was, of course, uh, little way of intervening on site to produce new documentation. So the only possible action was to save digital heritage documentation stored locally from destruction, especially images and TV models. And we also called others to support this uh, activity, among others, uh, the Polish Academy of Science, Visual Dimension, a small uh, company, which is also a Polish partner, Carare, the well-known uh, uh, network uh, uh, addressing uh, digital archaeology and documentation, the University of Vilnius, and, and others as well. How did, did it work? Uh, users from initially Ukraine uh, were asked to contact us by email and receiving, uh, after receiving a, a username and the password uh, to enter the system. Such users were contacted by mouthword. So, initial contact contacted others and, and so on. Uh, the the data sets uh, were uploaded to an uh, uh, INFN server in Florence using a, a web user interface or other tools. Uh, to, to carry out the, the, the uh, uh, upload and uh, transfer it to the uh, INFN Center server at uh, CNAF in Bologna after checking uh, the, the content uh, uh, of the uh, uploads. We prepared also user manuals available in English and Ukrainian, and you can see here the um, cover of the Ukrainian manual and uh, of course files were kept uh, ready to return them to the owner when the uh, danger situation would be over. The map shows the data provenance, main cities uh, are uh, evidenced in the, the red circle and they are mainly Kiev, Odessa and Lviv and other smaller, smaller cities uh, uh, are represented by blue circles. To develop and to carry out the project, we have contact with Ukrainian authorities. Uh, you can see here a screenshot of one of these meetings. You can not myself, you click uh, uh, from the CH and other two colleagues uh, uh, collaborating and uh, 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 other professionals uh, from uh, the Ukrainian cultural heritage uh, community and the deputy minister 
uh, for innovation. The, it was very well supported by the uh, EU Commission, and you can see a screenshot of the page published uh, on the EU website. And below the table reports the results. We had, we had about 100 terabytes available, some 80 were used during the uh, upload. By the way, the upload is still continuing uh, today, but uh, there is not, not much more to, to upload to now. And uh, uh, we have received about uh, uh, little more than 250,000 files involving 18 institutions. On the, on the project web, website, there is uh, more documentation and reporting uh, uh, more information. And we also produced uh, two short videos, uh, which are published uh, on Vimeo at these uh, addresses. What will, hap will happen next? Files uh, are kept ready to be returned to the owner when the situation will be uh, calmer and the, the peace will become again. We also have plans to train engineering professionals in making 3D models of cultural heritage with uh, different technologies, installing the legal documentation in a findable and accessible way so to get uh, fair. Uh, files and the repositories, using the models to plan and implement uh, restoration and or reconstruction, and then eventually using 3D for communication and education. So there are plans to carry out this kind of training uh, with, the, of course, with the support of the European Commission. The images show the situation. On the left, you see the st statue of the Duke of Richelieu in uh, Odessa, and on the right uh, uh, there is a thin model of the current situation of this statue uh, uh, covered by protective sandbags uh, against uh, the uh, bombing uh, of the town. Which lessons have we learned? First of all, that documenting heritage in the D is an important way of preserving it. Uh, disasters come always unexpected, as the war in Ukraine has shown, but also the war and terrorism in Syria and the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. The earthquake has destroyed, uh, for example, the uh, uh, Roman fort, uh, which most probably was not uh, documented in the D. <coughs> so it could be a good idea to create a task force to assist in saving the digital documentation or to create it from scratch when it does not exist. Uh, I would like to call it uh, the digital monuments team, remembering the monuments man who in the Second World War saved the European heritage from Nazi looting and war destruction. To do this, uh, if the documentation is not existing, uh, 3D um, processing uh, software uh, which is largely available, should be used uh, relying on images uh, by different sources, documentation images or tourist images or something taken from the internet. Uh, a notable recent example uh, concerns uh, uh, Palmyra, where images have been used to create real models uh, uh, and the virtual reconstruction of the uh, destroyed monuments uh, by, by the Italians. However, a similar work was done 20 years ago by Professor Grün and his team at the Polytechnic of Zurich to digitally reconstruct the great Buddha of Bamiyan destroyed by the Italians. They used uh, some technical, ima technical images and photos but also some tourist photos, uh, and today the digital technology has much progressed uh, in this uh, kind uh, of uh, um, operation that is uh, reconstructing uh, 3D models uh, from uh, diverse uh, 2D resources. Thank you for your attention, and here you have my email address and the website of the project if you want to know more about
about sun and about all creation. Thank you so much, Franco, for this deeply important work. I find it uh, very interesting and it's, it's just great that this is a community effort that has started up um, instead of a, a top-down project. Um, so thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I will uh, move us on to our next presentation by Mike Ferguson. Um, Mike is co-founder and CEO of Viospatia AB, he is a, which is a 3D metrology uh, startup company based in Visby, uh, right here in Sweden. So uh, he has uh, a lot of expertise when it comes to 3D in Sweden. I'm looking forward to his talk as well. Um, so Mike, the floor is yours. Thank you. I hope this works now. Uh, so I'm going to present a project that I'm part of called Ancient Images 2.0. Uh, it's based at Stockholm University, and as project partners, we have Gotland's Museum in Visby, and of course, the National Heritage Board, uh, and myself working on the digitization aspect of this project. Uh, and what we're doing is digitizing the picture stones on Gotland, which are a collection of monuments dating from 400 to around 1100 AD. Uh, so essentially they are one of the only contemporary sources sources of basically viking and these periods culture um, that actually depict uh, art um, ships clothing uh, and mythology uh, and of course we move into runestones in the later viking period um, so I'll, I'll give you a brief overview of how has it been documented in the past uh, so we have a lot of sketches, tracings, uh, and rubbings from the last few hundred years. Uh, and of course, these are preserved, but um, in a way they are all inherently biased. This, for example, was about a hundred years ago, a tracing, and you see lots of details in this carving. Um, and today, they, after a hundred years or more, they have weathered quite much. Uh, they're made of limestone. Uh, which, of course, rain affects greatly, especially acid rain, basically eating away the, the lime. Uh, so we have more or less, how do we preserve these as best we can today? Uh, so we decided on photogrammetry. Um, for me, 3D uh, is a great... Um, what was that mine? Yeah, it's... Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll try not to move too much. Uh, so, so uh, laser scanning would have been basically impossible. Uh, and besides, I think that color is one of the most important parts of 3D um, that uh, conservators would like to get the, the real color data per vertex or polygon. Um, so I developed in, in partnership with um, a Swiss camera company called Alpa, a 150 megapixel camera specifically for photogrammetry. Um, more or less, my goal was the highest possible accuracy to preserve these artifacts um, and monuments for as long as we can. Um, so I have a short film of, I hope there's no sound because it's maybe a bit loud in, in places, but there are, uh, at the start of the project, there were 570 odd uh, stones and fragments. And now by the end, there are 650 roughly. Um, so the digitization took part in museum storages, in museums on display, uh, in the historical museum here in Stockholm, and also in, in Visby, uh, in the fields, uh, built into churches. Many of the stones have been reused, uh, so many of them are in, in farmer's fields, in church ruins. Uh, it's quite a complex bit of digitization. Many are loose, are built into different um, places and positions in churches like steps. Uh, so as you can imagine, as the front step of a church, they're usually quite weathered. Oh, 
Yeah, great. Um, so this this is actually in a church. Those beams are original, uh, almost a thousand years old. Uh, many of them have been destroyed actually when they installed uh, electricity in the church attics. Um, and so preserving them as, as best we can is really, really important. Uh, and making them accessible to people because many, <laughs> uh, <laughs> many people can't actually go into these churches as well. Uh, so the goal of the project is to make all of these uh, available for the public um, in a digital database. And so all the 3D models will be publicly available. Now, one issue is the historic documentation of these um, by Suna Lindqvist in the first half of the 1900s. He essentially interpreted all of the carvings. Um, so all of these uh, carvings on the stone has more or less been in interpreted by a, a few men, and they've been painted uh, to reflect that. So all current research is based on images of painted surfaces. Um, and in many cases, we can see, uh, for example, this is a human sacrifice scene. But if you actually look at the 3D model, it's very faint, it's very difficult to see. So we don't know, maybe 100 years ago it was much more visible, uh, but today it's very difficult to see, okay, is this actually a scene? Um, there are cases where he didn't paint very much, but we can see on the 3D model, I don't know if you can see, you can see men with beards and mouths and noses here. Uh, it's quite faint, faintly carved, so it's difficult to bring it out. Um, but then again, they're painted, not as we can see in the 3D model. So I think it's, it's really important to give this data to people and remove the bias of these men from 100 years ago who interpreted all of these uh, drawings. Uh, for example, this is, this is a stone on display in the Historical Museum. Um, before this animal figure was interpreted as some strange animal, and then it was reinterpreted as a horse with a rider. Uh, and then we can see in the 3D model, it's actually a very strange dragon-like creature. We're not really sure what it is, myth mythological type of creature, uh, maybe a hippocamp, a Roman, a Greek, Greco-Roman figure. Um, and also to confirm new interpretations, as some thought maybe there was a snake on this stone, and others thought it was a warrior with a sword and shield, and um, a woman with a drinking horn. And we can see actually on the 3D model, that a later interpretation is probably correct. Uh, we, we're playing with lots of different ways of visualizing the 3D data. Um, and I think uh, this is a, a very famous stone on the side of a church in Bro, uh, on Gotland, about 10 minutes outside of Eastby. And actually never before noticed there's actually a horse just in the top right corner uh, of this stone. And it's people have been walking by and looking at it for a very long time. Uh, you can see, I don't know if there's a laser pointer on this, but. Uh, yeah, so there, these are the legs, and you have the head here, um, and it actually might have horns, so it might actually not be a horse, but there are a couple of legs here. Uh, so there is some sort of animal figure that's not been seen before, or painted um, by Sunil Fist and his contemporaries. Uh, so this is also uh, another one where this stone was lost for about 60 years, uh, and it was rediscovered as part of the project, and it's actually one of the the most well-preserved stones because it was lost uh, in storage in a museum. So we have a warrior figure uh, with highly detailed belt, and this is maybe uh, five millimeters, uh, this belt area. So rather relatively small and highly detailed carvings, which on the stones outside have been weathered to next to nothing left. So I wish we could have scanned them 100 years ago, but we're doing the best we can now. Uh, and a, a topic that came up before uh, was accurate scaling, uh, and for me, it's the most important part. So we actually developed scale bars uh, through with the National Heritage Board support uh, to basically have the highest possible accuracy we can have in scaling, and um, and with our camera setup, um, which is a 150 megapixel camera. So we've generated about 40 terabytes of data, uh, and my question posing that I would like to pose is how do we store all of this data if we are digitizing so much now and the goals are to digitize as much as we can? Uh, where will we store it? Who will fund it? Uh, and, and how will we preserve it long term for everyone? Thank you. Oh, I will. oh. actually, I had a couple more. This was, this was another one that um, 
yeah, this is uh, basically the Idris of the World Tree, which was standing alone on a stone, and we actually found there were a number of figures on either side, so kind of exciting stuff that we haven't done. But thank you. Thanks again, Mike. I'm glad that, that you can see what is on those, yeah. with those pictures, because I, <laughs> we're working on it, making it better. Great. Um, now, I take your questions uh, with me throughout the day. I hope that we may find at least some ideas or answers to how do we store all of this data, how do we preserve it, uh, do this sustainably as well with climate change, the green transition. We want to make sure that we're not putting all of this data in servers that are just running forever and uh, creating a lot of CO2. So I think these are very important topics to look at. Maybe some of those questions will be answered in the next panel, uh, where I will invite uh, Valentin back onto the stage together with Katerina Mutogiani. Uh, Katerina is a policy officer for DigiConnect, and uh, both of them will have a bit of a discussion on some of the questions we have raised today. Thank you both for being here. Wonderful. So let's have a bit of a talk, <laughs> shall we? Um, the main feeling that I've got throughout this day, of course, through the, it's important, we need to digitize it. Um, to me, it really feels like there is some sense of urgency behind this as well. We, we heard, of course, the war in Ukraine, there is a, a, a very real urgency, but from the commission and from DG Connect as well, there is uh, this, this, this drive, this push to digitize now. Uh, we heard it from Rehana as well, start somewhere. Um, so my first question would be for you, Katerina, um, where does this sense of urgency come from? And how does this translate in the uh, recommendation that, that you've written up? Yeah. So, first of all, thank you uh, very much. I'm very, very pleased uh, to be here. And uh, I think this is a very important event, uh, which hopefully marks the beginning of um, a number of events uh, under the uh, future Council Presidencies uh, so uh, it, it's really important for us. Um, of course, I'd like to thank the European Foundation and the uh, uh, Swedish <laughs> Ministry of Culture and Swedish Heritage Board and the Museum for uh, hosting this. Uh, so I think uh, I would say that the discussion on 3D and the urgency to digitize and document uh, in order to preserve goes back a number of years. Uh, it's not new. And uh, I would also, uh, for example, I'm thinking of the fire in Notre Dame uh, back in 2019, which, uh, well, it happened just six days after the, uh, well, 27 EU countries signed a joint declaration of cooperation for advancing 3D digitization of uh, cultural heritage and agreed to collaborate and step up efforts together under the pillar of a pan-European initiative on, uh, on 3D digitization of cultural heritage. So for us, this was this mark again, uh, and it was an important uh, uh, achievement, I would say, uh, because it showed the interest and the commitment of member states to embark on uh, 3D digitization. Um, as commission, we followed this up with uh, a number of uh, other actions, and I'm going to talk about it later. Um, of course, funding projects as well. Uh, but then this led uh, to the um, to including 3D as one of the focuses of the recommendation on the common European data space for cultural heritage. So this um, this recommendation, uh, which was adopted a bit more than a year ago now in 2021, revised. Uh, the previous recommendation on digitization online accessibility and preservation, which was there from 2011, so 10 years later, we felt the need to update it uh, with the challenges and developments uh, at that time. And 3D seemed very timely after uh, the previous uh, uh, work, discussion on and, and uh, uh, will to collaborate on, on 3D digitization. I would like to show a couple of slides and give you a little bit, uh, a little bit the context of, uh, of the recommendation, because it doesn't only talk about 3D, but it presents um, 
um, a wider framework, a wider policy framework in that area. It is addressed to member states and the objectives are to help member states accelerate digitization and preservation efforts, to uh, also help seize the opportunities of digital transformation for cultural heritage institutions, and of course to pave the way for a common European data space for cultural heritage. Uh, the recommendation invites member states to take action on a number of areas, but I'm only going to present here some specific areas which are more closely related to the, the 3D uh, digitization. So overall, uh, it invites member states to set or update comprehensive forward-looking digital strategies, um, up, take measures, uh, to support uh, the, the uptake of advanced technologies by heritage institutions, including 3D, but also external reality, artificial intelligence, data technologies. And then one of the uh, articles in this, um, in this um, uh, chapter, which is about digitization, digital preservation, is inviting member states to um, set specific digitization and digital preservation goals in their strategy based on criteria uh, including cultural heritage risk, the most physically visited cultural heritage uh, monuments, uh, buildings and sites, and then uh, also the low level of digitization for specific categories of cultural heritage assets. The idea is that member states, uh, when setting up this strategy, reflect on what is important for them to digitize under these categories, but not under these criteria, but not only. And it's what the general director of the, of the Swedish uh, Heritage Board uh, talked about earlier on, really thinking, discussing what is important to put in that strategy. Um, and of course, it refers to digital skills. So it invites member states to take measures to assess the digital uh, uh, gap that there might be in the cultural heritage uh, sector and upskilling and reskilling cultural heritage professionals by 2030. And uh, when we heard it's not only skills, of course, it's the cost. Uh, so we invite the, com the Commission, invite Member State to try to use, uh, make use of as many as possible funding possibilities at EU uh, and national level for that. Coming to the targets. Uh, by 2030, uh, the recommendation invites member states to digitize in 3D all monuments and sites falling under the cultural heritage at risk uh, category and 50% of those falling under uh, the most physically visited cultural heritage monuments, buildings and sites. And uh, there's an intermediate checkpoint for 2025. But also for us, digital preservation is also important. So digitizing on its own is not enough. Uh, archiving, digital preserving uh, all assets uh, under A, B, and C is also uh, one of the areas that the recommendation uh, addresses. But that was the part of preservation, uh, digitization and preservation. There's the other chapter which talks about uh, the common European data space for cultural heritage. And there, uh, again, contribution of digitized assets to the data space and to Europeana is one of, of the key areas that uh, member states are invited uh, to um, uh, encourage their cultural heritage institutions to, to embark on. We want higher quality contributions. Uh, we have indicative targets for member states in the annex of the recommendation. And uh, it's also important to say that uh, the recommendation asks that public funding uh, should be made conditional uh, in digitization projects upon making available the results uh, in, the, in the data space. It does not mean making it completely freely available, that's not possible, uh, but uh, it is making it available with the right conditions. And uh, here we also see uh, the other aspects. So 3D is not only for preservation, but making it accessible, ma making 3D content accessible in the data space allows showcasing European cultural heritage uh, to reaching and reaching uh, more audiences, and of course uh, allows reuse in other sectors. We have some very very ambitious targets here in the recommendation. 
and uh, uh, the, uh, the the bar is set very high at 60 million 3D digital assets uh, by 2030 across the member states' contribution. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I just wanted uh, to stress here. So it, we have those two uh, areas. So focus on digitizing, digitally preserving, but also focus on making it available for, for various uses. Thank you so much, Katarina. Ambitious targets. <laughs> That's very true. Yeah, you mentioned the, the role of Europeana in uh, the European data space for cultural heritage. And I'm uh, wondering mostly for you, Valentin, um, how you see the role of Europeana in uh, this recommendation, in its targets. Um, does Europeana have any plans to accommodate 3D in its database and in its work? Um, yeah. <laughs> so indeed. So as part of the the, the, the current contract, uh, Europeana Foundation started uh, on uh, deploying the, the data space for cultural heritage. So 3D is one of the uh, an important component of the work we we need to do in the, in the next uh, coming two years. So. Indeed, so we are looking at uh, at working on different uh, different front to also support you in a, in a, in a, in accelerating around the, around 3D. Uh, so of course we are not doing this uh, this alone. So uh, we are working with partner within the consortium, the data space consortium, but also with uh, the European aggregators uh, in every countries and domains that are also uh, providing their, their expertise um, on this question. So. I would say one of the priority first is to um, review and refine um, our frameworks around around 3D to accommodate 3D. So the frameworks we have already cover 3D, but in a very high level way. So now with all the presentation we see, there there is the need to go uh, to to go. Um, a bit to have a bit more granular uh, recommendations. So this is the work we have started to do and will continue to do. So, for example, reviewing and refining refining the Europana data model, which is uh, the data model uh, Europana used to uh, to aggregate data. Uh, the Europana publishing framework, which defines the, the quality of the content and the quality of the metadata. So we need to look at 3D what what qualify, what makes a 3D model of good quality, what are the, the criteria we could use to then adjust the tiers, um, the, the system of tiers we have for other material, how we can make it uh, more, more meaningful for 3D. Uh, and then also working on the, Euro, um, the European licensing framework, uh, also to make sure that 3D is, uh, is more clearly mentioned as part of this framework, so that we are also making sure that the 3D models that are, are that are being produced can also be shared and being reused. Uh, at the moment, uh, with the few 3D models we have in Yopana, this is a bit of the issue we face, where in fact, when we have um, educators that are interested in reusing this material, uh, a lot of what we have is under conditions that do not allow um, this type of reuse uh, that we have seen presented already this morning. Um, so yeah, so this will be the, the work on the framework. We will do it in, a, in an iterative process because yeah, there are many things to consider, uh, and also um, um, yeah, since we the idea is also to accelerate, we don't want to put the bar too high at the beginning. So that's why we will review those framework um, in an iterative uh, process. Um, then another. Um, Another uh, layer is also what we, in a way, are doing already today. It's to build capacity around around 3D, so making sure that documentation is available. So together with uh, with uh, the partner, for example, from 4CH, uh, Kaare, which is the aggregator for, for archaeology, we are already gathering all the the recommendations, the the guidelines, the documentation available on 3D, so that you can find it. And, and, uh, and use this to, to start your, your activities. Uh, we will be also organizing uh, events like this one uh, and, uh, and also uh, trainings, uh, relying again on, uh, on, uh, on the aggregators that can help also spread uh, the, the, the work. Um, so yeah, so those are the activities that are planned. Uh, we have already uh, started uh, to, to do some and, uh, and I think we all have a role to play in this because uh, this work requires also a lot of coordination because there are many, in fact, 
when you start looking into it, you realize there are many initiatives, like what, uh, what was presented around the, the, the Swedish uh, stones. There are many, many initiatives that have something to contribute. So I expect that a lot of the work will be, in fact, in the coordinating our activities and putting together what, uh, what we have to offer. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, I mean, the, the capacity building here is really important, engaging the sector, making sure that there is this push beyond this room where, where maybe we're already preaching to the converted about the importance of 3D. Um, what, in, in both of your minds, I guess, would be the next steps or the best way to really mobilize the sector the way that uh, a lot of the projects that we've seen now have already been mobilized? Uh, maybe, Valentin, you can, you can start. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, well, Rihanna <laughs> mentioned yeah, the, 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 the hardest step is to, to make the first 3D. So, so I think it's, uh, I guess, yeah, the idea is to go over a bit this, uh, this first uh, hurdle. Um, I think in a way, 3D also, yeah, challenges again the, this, um, our, our ability to collaborate together. So, you know, we, we have done it very well in the past for other type of materials. So I think we need to, to, to do that again in, a, in 3D and, and it's a bit starting, not starting from scratch, but looking again with, with a type of, um, uh, this type of material, how we can again, how, what, what should be the best, the most efficient way to collaborate together so that, yeah, we can really um, accelerate those, uh, those activities. So I guess this can be done locally, like here today you have a lot of Swedish actors, so it's also for you to see, okay, how, how we can work together to benefit from, uh, from the expertise you, you, you probably and you already have. Um, and then, yeah, you um, we are here also to, to stimulate those efforts and try to, to support the best we can also those, uh, those, uh, those efforts. Do you agree, Katarina? Start somewhere? Yeah, yeah. so I will uh, follow up on what uh, Valentin said. And uh, I would like to uh, refer again to the, uh, it was a report called Basic Principles and Tips for 3D Digitization that was uh, uh, created about two years ago, but it's still relevant, uh, with the collaboration of uh, 40 experts in, in 3D and uh, members of the expert group uh, at the commission. Um, so uh, I don't know, I mean, we will be able to share the link after the event, uh, but I think uh, this is a useful uh, guideline to um, basically cultural heritage professionals, uh, organizations, that don't have so much experience and don't know where to start. And this puts together all the different considerations under 10 basic principles uh, that uh, someone embarking on a digitization project or considering embarking uh, on a digitization project should, should reflect on. And then there are the tips under each principle. So really, I, I think it's a great starting point. It talks about uh, the uh, considering the value, considering what to digitize, how to digitize, uh, internally or externally, how to plan for a certain budget or a certain timeline. So it's all the different aspects that uh, someone uh, needs to have in mind about how to start. And um, that's one, uh, I would say, uh, thing. And I'm also, um, I, I was also thinking that perhaps, I mean, we've seen examples here in this conference. Uh, we know of examples uh, that are happening around Europe, uh, but perhaps putting together like a list of um, those examples and con respective contact points uh, because we all agree that exchanging and learning from each other's experience uh, is a key uh, is a key way to to progress i want to start and progress um, great thank you yeah i think sharing those those guidelines after this panel will yeah. be a great place yeah. to start for yeah. a lot of organizations looking for these tips, these best practices. In, in, yeah, in fact, if I may, the third, the third uh, <laughs> point is that uh, in the uh, framework of the uh, expert group, the CEDC expert group with member states representatives, uh, we're also discussing uh, 3D digitization, uh, also uh, in the context of implementing progress with implementing the, the uh, recommendation. And uh, we have had some bilateral meetings, but we'll continue to have bilateral meetings with the member states. And also, uh, with, uh, we, will, uh, we will try 
to integrate that in the discussions uh, in the upcoming meetings. So thank you. Great. Um, maybe as a, as a last question be, before we move on, uh, maybe a bit of a provocative uh, question about the, the seeming tension that there is between we need to start somewhere, we need to start digitizing, and also the need to have high quality, high standards, tier four data in your piano in the data space. Um, would, would you prefer to have quicker 3D objects that are maybe of lower quality, don't follow the best practices, or should we take the extra time and effort and cost of making sure that they are meeting the standards, meeting the tiers that, that we want? Maybe Valentin, your closing remark. Yeah, so I think um, what, what is important is really to think about the, 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 re, the, the reuse use cases. So. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't uh, push everyone to in, to start directly investing in a in very uh, yeah high definition, high quality, complex project um, unless it's relevant for the use cases that is at stake. So for something like the the Swedish stones we have seen, yeah, for this use case, indeed, you need something that is uh, very of high quality because the idea is indeed to to go beyond this interpretation of the stone and really see the, the detail, detail on, the, on the stones. But for an applications like uh, the one, the use case we saw on the, with the visual impairment, you might not need something that is as detailed or as granular, you know, in terms of the, the layers, the texture, you know, there are some texture that are more important than others because the use case is about uh, people with visual impairment. So I think the, the main point is really to think why why you are doing it and, and how you are thinking to to reuse this uh, yeah thank you katarina you're yeah i statement. would uh, i think i would agree um in in general i think it's also in the recommendation about how uh, members should think when planning uh, cultural heritage institutions also how they should think so it's considering really uh the uh well, yes, the, the purposes, the use cases, the target user groups. Uh, this is also in the basic uh, principles and tips. But the basic principles and tips advise um, the experts who wrote it, advise that uh, institutions should really uh, aim for the highest affordable quality when capturing uh, um, a, a, an asset, a cultural heritage asset. It's because now what is high quality now might be low quality later and this uh, would allow reusing the possibly what has been captured later on and at the same time uh, the different versions and formats can be created uh, in order to serve uh, the targeted uh, purpose and the targeted uh, user groups so I think these are considerations that need to be thought ahead of a digitization project. And uh, yes, uh, I think well, one can start small, but the goal is, of course, to be able to, to, to scale up eventually. Great. Start small and scale up. It's a really <laughs> good conclusion. Thank you both, Valentin and Katarina, for your Thank time. Thank you very much. Thanks. Great, reuse is one of the most important things to keep in mind when working on what to digitize and what a great reuse case that we'll have right now. Uh, Marinos, welcome to the stage. Uh, Thank you. Marinos Ioannidis is responsible for the e-preservation Cyprus University of Technology. Um, you'll be presenting a really important reuse case to us, the Asino Church and uh, the VG study that is connected with it. So Marinos, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here today. Yes. Um, and especially in this particular day, it's a key day uh, for me, but also for the international community. Today is the international World Heritage Day. And it's the day that the monument or the building about which I will talk today is celebrating. It's a big coincidence. And thank you very much for that. 
actually on that particular day I'm going always to the monument and uh, not to the EU presidency events but it was a great pleasure and thank you very much for uh, the social media society the hashtags given by ICOMOS are here below so uh, I'm coming from the Digital Cultural Heritage UNESCO Chair as well as the uh, EU Era Chair named Mnemosini. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in a museum. Mnemosini was the lady, the mother of the nine muses, and the nine muses had a special temple named Museum where the ancient Greeks went to do what? To preserve their memory, to ask these nine ladies, please keep my memory forever. I will, I like only to recall uh, Homer, the first words of this very unique uh, uh, piece that he wrote, uh, Odysseus, was what? Calling the muses to keep his thoughts until he will manage uh, to write his uh, work alive, yeah? So, now, um, we are working there by saying behind us is the memory of our parents, in front of us, are the eyes of our children, a part of our memories here in your country, because a young boy 100 years ago decided to spend his holiday in Cyprus, in the lovely island of Venus. And he was so impressed when he returned back to Sweden, asked his parents, listen, I want to study archeology. span And he did, and that boy is your Grand Grand King Gustav VI. And that's the reason we have a piece of our memory here. And we do hope to see Deva once the day comes in Europeana or repatriated in Cyprus. <laughs> so it's all about the memory, the story, the identity. That's why we digitize 3D. And it's all about this unique building. That's the building the first day when the photographer visited the space, the, the site. Um, that's from the archive, National Archive in Cyprus, 1909. So, same building, the building, 1957, we were under English rule until 1960, yeah? So, and the building in 1958, the building again, 59, under restoration, and the building today as a World Heritage Site. But comparing with uh, Notre Dame, you are asking yourself, so what? What's the important here? Let's see, let's start with the documentation. And when we document, we say it's all about the user needs. We need to take that into account. Otherwise, there is no reason to digitize. And of course, it's all about to preserve the identity at the end of the day. And by talking identity, the first war after the Second World War on this continent was in Cyprus in 1974. The second was in Yugoslavia, and the third is currently running. Yeah, experiencing. So when we digitize, it's for all these professions here. And of course, when we want to harvest content to Europeana, that's because of them. Otherwise, the use and reuse has no scope. So, and if we put it down and see the nice monument, how it is presented in the different variations, it looks like, now yeah, again, what's the special thing? But nevertheless, let's see. That was the first three digitization of a monument on the island of Cyprus in 2005. Since then, we are 
uh, monitoring the, mon the, the, the monument, and we are digitizing that every four to five years. So that was the first 3D object harvested in Europeana. We are very, very proud about that. And that was happening in a special council meeting. I'm going back. I'm preserving also you, content. Huh? So, <laughs> Um, when uh, a council meeting of the ministers of culture in Brussels, uh, every minister uh, gave a present to Europeana, and that was from our minister. And that was happened when the first Cyprus presidency of the EU council. And we are monitoring the monument, and we are looking here, see, the high tech in the monument. The monument is moving, ladies and gentlemen. We are on an earthquake area. And talking now about the different EU projects and our activities, we had the, to carry out a special study. And please allow me to share with you. If you can please play, yes. The nice music behind is for the IPR issues, but also to honor the sponsor of this nice work. Enjoy the video, ladies and gentlemen, and that's all about. From the digitization, from keeping the memory, memory, the knowledge, and the identity of this unique monument alive. This is a place where you have to visit when you come to Cyprus. Actually, during the negotiations, EU negotiations for the enlargement of the EU with Cyprus, it was a must to take to that side all the EU uh, policymakers. It's so unique. So, Harry mentioned in his presentation uh, the use of new technologies. We tried to bring the monument to talk, to tell us its story, to bring it online. And we tried several attempts. Here are some of them. The icon is also, and we haven't digitized the building. We haven't only digitized the frescoes. We digitized the icons. We digitize, ladies and gentlemen, everything. What exists in libraries, in archives, and you will see now something else which is unique and I haven't seen in any other digitization. This is the time machine of the monument. We digitize even the priest. <laughs> we digitize even the liturgy, the liturgy which is now currently ongoing on that monument and we try to have it in a such a way so that it is visible and presented to everybody the monument went even to the school Come to it. Monument was a key case study at the inception project. And this is the documentation. Rehana mentioned BIM this morning, building information model on the level of detail 400 where we have the geometry with the pathology together and that's for reasons of monitoring i'm, I'm coming to the end here's a little g currently ongoing and you will see something which is unique ladies and gentlemen because we tried to bring the monument to talk but how to do it? It's not so easy. So therefore, we took the advantage of the advanced technologies and we took the person in charge of the monument, voila, the priest. 
This is the metaverse. 2018, it has been presented in Brussels, and we got the Innovation Prize at the Innovators Fair in Brussels. Which is a large yes. tradition going to the second half of the 12th century. So the interior of Panagia from Fiorosan is entirely covered with work paintings which vary in paint. Oh, it's coming to an end. And of course, here the study, the complexity, the quality, the BIM LOD 400. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, we are very proud. Here is a QR code to download the study if you want to scan it. In the meantime, four EU projects are based on the study, 24 universities around the world, 18 stakeholders, six research centers, and two industrial centers, uh, entities, are using the results of the study. That's an impact, isn't it? Made in EU, and we are very proud because out of the 24 universities, Stanford, is Harvard, is Cambridge, is Oxford, those universities are outside of Europe. Yep. Marina, so, thank you so much. Thank you also. Lovely. I think I now know not only what the first digitized 3D object was, but the most digitized object ever in every layer possible is in Cyprus, this innocuous church. Yes, and you have to visit it. Oh, I will. I mean, I have to. Yes. Yeah. Either digital it's a must. or physical. Yes. Thanks again, Marinos. We'll move on to uh, our next uh, presentation, which is online. Uh, it's also pre-recorded, uh, but Jill Cousins, I think, is online with us as well for any questions that you might have in the chat. Um, Jill Cousins is the director of the Hunt Museum currently, but she's also deeply entrenched in Europeana. She, had, she was there at the start, right until 2018, she led Europeana. Um, she'll be talking to us mostly about 3D digitization in her current role um, at the Hunt Museum. So uh, let's start that pre-recorded session. Jill, go ahead. Okay, hello everybody. Lovely to see you all um, here. You have a kind of 3D virtual version of uh, me giving you a talk on the 3D digitization of museum objects and why it's simple and not expensive. So at the Hunt Museum, we know a couple of things about who does or who does not come into the museum and a couple more about how people of all ages and backgrounds engage with the museum. And um, we know that they want to do things, they want to make things, they want to interact with the objects these days. And we need to provide ways of them doing that. So from the point of view of the objects themselves uh, within the museum, we have a very diverse collection, a uh, range of periods, materials and sizes. They range from the, uh, the for instance, the Egyptian, a uh, monkey that you can see at the bottom, uh, the god of Toth, he's 2,000 years old, through the Sybil Connolly collection, which is 1950s Irish fashion designer, right up to date with our Irish contemporary ceramics uh, collection. Everything that uh, can be in the public domain is in the public domain, or in the case of Sybil Connolly, it has been dedicated to the public domain, which means it can be very widely shared and used, and it is. Today, however, I'm going to give you a quick of why some wherefores are for 3D digitization for a small museum. So we have 15 core staff and about 3,000 objects in the collection. And the idea is to demonstrate that it's not so difficult or, or expensive to do so. So far in our experience, the 3D digitization process more than satisfies it, the use cases that we and others have for those objects. And I'll come to the process in a minute, but look quickly at some of our uh, use cases to start with. The first is a museum in a garden. The aim here is to have the objects escape the walls of the museum, because as we all know, lots of people don't actually come into the museum in the first place. And so far, three have done so with the help of local engineering companies, Arup, Takumi, and Kirby. The first is our Met Man. Um, he's about this high uh, in the museum, and he is represented here in the garden. Um, he is Trakoya, which is now Irish constituted 
uh, wood material and he has been CNC cut. He's a very popular guy in the garden. The second is an Etruscan jug uh, that is being made um, out of cotton steel and um, water cut engineering by uh, Takumi. And this one is, as we speak, being made. It's our dodecahedron, which will become a two and a half meter high uh, sculpture in the garden, and it will be in orange. Um, we also use it for sensory experiences, so, so the 3D scanning become 3D models. They unlock our museum in a box audio files that tell the story behind the object, but they also allow for a much more tactile experience of the object behind the glass. They, the 3D uh, scans have been used for our interactive table. This allows you to see um, our collection temporally and geographically, and it really engages people in learning when they can dig deeper into the object, turn the object around and upside down and the like. It is, of course, uh, used for our website, for the Europeana website, for sharing and for uh, research. And um, increasingly, we are using it uh, to work with the visually impaired. So this is where you see actually the visually impaired as co-creators being able to handle, in this case, the object, but they won't always be able to do so. So that's why the 3D replica of them works. And of course, we use it for entertainment reasons. So this was um, on McMahon, who was 3D uh, scanned. And then um, he became uh, an augmented reality object boogieing in the captain's room of the museum. Uh, the processes and the, the costs of, of uh, uh, creating uh, these uh, 3D scans as far as the museum is concerned. And why I don't think it's so difficult for even a smallish museum uh, such as the uh, Hunt Museum to do. I'm going to start with the volunteer uh, side of it, so the people that you need in order to do the scanning in the first place. Um, we've been very successful at involving volunteers, um, students, community members. We've used scanathons and volunteer engagement. We have a kind of symbiotic relationship uh, between those with the skills and expertise, sharing their marketable skills with volunteers, research students, interns, and they gain transferable skills and uh, research uh, uh, or, and or research material, depending on what they want to do with it. The process is, uh, so usually our 3D digitization is pretty project focused. So whether that's for education, engagement projects that need 3D digitization, then uh, the member of staff requests those objects. Um, they're pulled out on a day when we've got volunteers in the museum, a room is set aside, and the objects are taken off display and digitized. The models are then post-processed using tools such as MeshLab um, and Blender, and they're added to Sketchfab where metadata is added. Carare's 3D, uh, share, share 3D tool is integrated into Sketchfab, so new models can be pulled through from Sketchfab, and then metadata added in text form to the dashboard, very easily meeting the requirements of the European data model. We then send a publication, notify Carrari, and they're published on Europeana and several other places. In terms of equipment, we have an iScan Pro, we have a detachable colour pack, a turntable with a target uh, pattern on it, a tripod and a mount. We tend to use extra lighting, and of course you need to be able to stabilise some of those objects that are being uh, scanned, so we have um, means of doing that. We have also several times used photogrammetry, which is better for uh, objects that have got a lot of holes in them, such as the dodecahedron, but also um, uh, things like jewellery. We have a, a tiara, for instance, that has been scanned that way. The digitization process is pretty simple, and there are a couple of techniques that are used to overcome some of the more tricky uh, objects. And that's the benefit of using object uh, of uh, experts such as John Beck, from Scan the World, or Ken Coleman, or Dermot Sheehan, who um, has been working with us for a while. 
The scanner um, can see the majority of the coded targets on that little turntable that you see down the bottom. And that means that it can uh, line up the scan and it has a known visual of where it, it uh, scanned from and to. Very useful for small objects that fit onto the turntable and don't block the, the targets. It's a method that will automatically recognize the turntable and edit it out, so less time in post-processing. If an object is too large, then obviously you're using the handheld scanner and you can get up and down around it, but that sometimes leads to uh, defects in the mesh, um, so you get underscanned or overscanned. Um, but it is sometimes the only way to capture an object. Dark, shiny, concave, transparent uh, surfaces, can, uh, surfaces can cause the scanner not to be able to see the object being scanned. So that's when we use something like a white sublimating spray to coat the object, like the helmet above, to give them a brighter uh, finish and enable them to be scanned. There is a post-processing uh, process for objects where maybe it had defects in the mesh that was created, the texture came out too dark, or the object was really uh, small. So then you're using the surfaces of the mesh, mesh to do paint onto, and you're taking photographs of the objects against those surfaces, and you're blending them onto the object, which means that you can take this tiny little amulet of God goddess Bess from our Egyptian collection. And on the left, you'll see uh, the original scan version. And on the right, you'll see the one that has actually had the photographs added to it. So making a lower resolution object much higher and much more uh, usable. Publishing process is that we uh, first publish them onto uh, Sketchfab, metadata and linked open data is added, use of their dashboard is very easy to pull it through. You log in, as many of you will know, into Share3D, very user-friendly interface, um, uh, you can see previously published models, models are not yet published and the like. You can then add your uh, metadata very easily. Um, and you're able then to publish um, through. Making it uh, publishable, accessible um, and uh, usable. I couldn't resist uh, this one, which is the, the dress. It's a maquette that Sybil Connolly made. You can actually see the original here. It's why I'm wearing this glove. Uh, this, uh, she used to post them pre-digital to her clients so that they could actually see what she was going to make from them. Now we 3D uh, scanned this um, and some guy decided he was going to 3D print it in his kitchen by his kitchen sink. This has resulted in a rather nice um, 3D version that is going to be used by our visually impaired co-curators. So finally, to the, the cost of, of, of making uh, this happen, to date, under European archaeology, um, if we've got about 8K under the art of reading in medieval Europe, we've got about 6K, and then we had some money from the Irish um, uh, Heritage Council to buy a laser scanner, laptop, tripod, um, about another 5K, and then there was another 5K on top. In all, it's about, uh, for um, 24K over four years. That's resulted in 362 of a potential of between 1250 and 1300 objects. So the cost per item to date is 66 euro, and I'm aiming to get that down to 50 euro per item, and the returns you've seen. So it's pretty simple um, and affordable. You need some funding for technology and training. You need some collections handling uh, training, volunteers and lead teachers in terms of the people who come in. Um, you need some staff and experts, uh, such as the scan world for digitizing and publishing. And then of course, you can use them. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jill. That was wonderful and a great message that 3D digitization doesn't have to break the bank. 
and you can start printing things next to your kitchen sink if you want to. That's what I uh, remember it anyway. Uh, before we go to our lunch, we have uh, another uh, fabled speaker, Marco Medici, who will talk to us about the importance of 2D objects um, to conceptualize 3D. Marco, you are part of the Inception project, as I understand it. Um, and you are also assistant professor at the University of Ferrara Department of Architecture. Uh, Marco, please take the stage. It's all yours. Is this working? Yeah, it's on. Number three. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Johan. Thank you very much for, to everyone for organizing this amazing event. It's wonderful to see uh, what we can do together. And as Johan said, I'm assistant professor at the University of Ferrara, and I'm CTO and founder of the Inception spin-off. That is a spin-off that is kind of just after the Inception project that is ended in 2019, and Marinas was, was part of that and already mentioned. Uh, the project. I will try to um, explain, in my opinion, how uh, which is the importance of the object uh, to con conceptualize 3D. Because um, yes, we uh, are working a lot with 3D. Uh, 3D gives us a way to understand the reality in a more immediate way, uh, in the sense that it's not mediated by something else, because we are experiencing experiencing the reality in 3D actually. So uh, while we are using something that is 2D, we are kind of putting into a media, into a bidimensional media, media our reality. So I will try to explain how we can use 2D to enrich and conceptualize 3D in three steps. First of all, we'll see how uh, 3D models can tell you more than that than that they show. Um, uh, basically, build information modeling, uh, or better, I would call it 3D information modeling because it's more general uh, approach to uh, information modeling uh, can tell us more than a simple mesh or uh, mesh with, with texture. Um, and then we'll see how each element of this three-dimensional model can, can tell you uh, something uh, by being enriched by semantics, by images, by documents, and so on and so forth. And at the end, we'll see how we implemented somehow the enrichment using the APIs for, for, from, from, from Europeana, so exploiting uh, the, the knowledge that we already have. Um, so first of all, the technologies that we are going to show uh, uh, has been developed within the Inception project and now are uh, still under the development by the Inception spin-off. And uh, they are also part, we are also part of the 5D culture project in which we will try to uh, implement even uh, uh, a more, um, uh, uh, a better correlation to, uh, to European. And uh, we are also part of the 4CH project, uh, in which uh, that, that has been already mentioned uh, several times this morning, uh, in which we are trying to use uh, inception technologies and make them compliant uh, with uh, a, a wider uh, scenario in Europe. Uh, so the process that we are used to uh, face is the one that um, starts from data capturing and then uh, needs an information modeling, a three-dimensional information modeling, which we are not only creating a 3D mesh or a, a 3D point cloud, but we are also interpreting the reality, creating shapes and segmenting uh, the models that we can capture. And in the end, we are going through the uh, final enrichment um, for making the model more, uh, com uh, more comprehensible to the final users. So uh, here is a small video. Uh, we are going through uh, three different videos. The first one is showing uh, the viewer that we uh, implemented in which we can see, uh, of course, the uh, 3D mesh with textures, but overlapped with a three-dimensional building information model. Uh, so building information modeling is going to be uh, compulsory across all Europe for public procurement. So we are uh, going to see uh, the creation of a lot of 3D dimensional information modeling also for uh, historical buildings 
and also restorers are using it for uh, scheduling their uh, intervention and for doing that they are separating the uh, reality into different objects so they are recognizing which are the beams which are the walls which are the, the window and so on and so forth um, i mm, do not like to call it as a building formation modeling since uh, the regulation of on building formation modeling is quite strict and here we are developing something more uh, uh, can, that can be more uh, um, useful for historical buildings that uh, do not follow a strict regulation as actual buildings. But when we are segmenting the reality, what we can do then is uh, uh, we, we can indeed enrich the three-dimensional model. What we have seen before was the Church of Santa Maria delle Vergini in Macerata in the central part of Italy. Uh, this is the Istituto degli Innocenti, a wonderful piece of the re Renaissance uh, designed by Bruno Nelleschi. And as you can see, all different pieces can be selected and clicked. And when we are clicking uh, some of those, uh, we can retrieve their metadata or paradata. And so in order to see which are the information that are connected to these single uh, uh, pieces. Uh, for instance, here we uh, implemented a connection with a, a Getty vocabulary in order to uh, show in uh, a more shared way uh, how they are coded who was the author and so on and so forth so we are actually enriching the three-dimensional model with uh, uh, a lot of different uh, information and at the same time we are uh, attaching to these elements pictures um, here is the picture of the tonda uh, they are 12 on the facade they are all different um, and Let's try to imagine how difficult it is to say to a student, okay, this is the picture of the third tondo from the left, the fourth from the right, and so on. So why don't show it just clicking on a single element and saying, okay, where it is, show me that kind of tondo. And we can do that using uh, pictures that we are um, shooting on our own, uh, pictures that, that are in archives, but when they are into archives and if they are into European itself, why don't use them? So in this case, we uh, are using a kind of different interface of uh, the platform that we developed. The platform is not actually intended to be a commercial platform or a platform open to everyone. Is for now just a way to show which are the potentiality of this kind of technology. And here we are exploiting the APIs from Europeana in order to search into this huge database uh, where are the information about of, uh, of the totals or uh, historical drawing of the facade. And so here, for instance, we are uh, selecting this picture here and we are associating this picture using semantic triples. So it, everything you are seeing is powered by uh, semantic technologies and semantic triples. And here, uh, after uh, connecting the picture of the entire building, we are also clicking on one single tondo and retrieving the historical picture of that specific tondo and attaching it to the uh, three, three dimensional model. So in this way, we can ensure not only that the model, the three dimensional model is enriched with a lot of uh, pieces of information that are fundamental for the understanding of this uh, uh, 3D object, but at the same time, we are also offering a new way of assessing the bidimensional content that are already available on a uh, platform like uh, the one that we like to use the most, <laughs> that is basically European. So, upload every. Uh, we can upload the semantic triples on our uh, uh, server and here we can show once again that the uh, historical picture of the tondo is associated to the single element on the facade. So that's all. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Marco. Um, I think this was a great uh, reuse case to end this uh, morning with. We've seen a bunch of really fascinating reuse cases from this, the 4CH project, uh, the SUM project, picture stones in Gotland, um, the, the Asinu Church, of course, um, and also I, I feel like it's been really great that we could explore these different um, crossroads between what 3D means and other things that are really important in cultural heritage, like inclusion uh, and diversity, uh, climate action, uh, the green transition, uh, sustainability. Uh, so I think we've, we have a really good grasp now of why is 3D important and how can we learn from some other 3D use cases. Uh, the day isn't over yet. Uh, we'll dive even deeper into 3D this afternoon with an actual guided 3D experience. Um, I am very curious as to what that will look like, and I hope you are as well. Um, I also hope that you're maybe a little bit hungry and want a little bit of a break, which I totally understand. Um, we'll have a break of about an hour now until 12.45. Um, I also saw that there were some questions online during the uh, presentations, and I see that those questions are also being answered online, so thank you so much to the speakers online for being in the chat and being very active. Um, that's great to see. So before I, uh, I, I let you go, if you're tweeting during the uh, lunch break saying how great all of this is, don't forget to use the hashtag EU2023SE, and we'll see you all back at 12.45. Have a great lunch. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back, everyone online. I'm sorry we couldn't give you lunch. Um, I must say it was it was very nice. It was great. I'm a big fan of the of the matmeka here, um, just next to our stage. Um, let me just find my documentation and we can start up again. Okay. We can already see some of the deeper dive into 3D that we will take part in this afternoon. I hope that you're all ready for some really great uh, presentations on 3D, mostly in Slovenia. Um, I'd love to present our two speakers who will take you on this journey through Slovenian cultural heritage. First, we have Uska Stark Peceni, who is uh, Chief Innovation Officer at Arctur, where she works together with Mateusz Strauss. Um, Arctur is an uh, innovation company that works a lot on 3D modeling um, and on bringing cultural heritage closer to tourists and to anyone who's interested in Slovenian cultural heritage. They will talk to us about Slovenia's tourism 3D campaign and I see an actual artifact uh, ready on the table here as well. So I'm very curious to hear what you have to say about that. Uh, Muchka, please. Thank you for the introduction. It's really a pleasure and an honor for us to be here Hello, with you. Um, I hope you had a great lunch and now you have energies to dive into the metaverse and all these things that we have been hearing um, today. Um, for the beginning, I have a mission hmm. after the lunch, but let's see, I, I will try to do that. Um, I would like to inspire you. We would like to inspire you, actually. And I will start. Um, I will actually start with something, with an idea that we had in Slovenia before COVID in uh, 2019. And it, it was born uh, out of uh, uh, R&D projects. It was act actually the largest uh, R&D pro project in the history of Slovenia focused on tourism. And I had the honor to, to manage that project with all major universities in the country. So we tried really to bring all the experts to the table and we were like envisioning what is going the tourism of tomorrow going to be. So how should it be? So we focused on like putting it in the center the quality of life of local residents and then building out of it. Um, and from there came the idea, okay, that we want to redirect the tourist flows from the main attractions, how to do that. We don't want Disneyland in Europe. What we want to do, we want to combine cultural heritage and new technologies. And this is how we came into this, let's say, sea or pool that we are swimming together today here. And all these spots in Slovenia are registered in movable cultural heritage. And so we saw this as, so every spot is like a diamond out of which we want to create a new experience. And um, this idea, as I said, so combining this physical and this digital together into this hybrid reality to make 
new experiences. And then we, ha we, had, we were lucky, actually, that we had uh, partners at the ministry um, who is responsible for, for tourism in Slovenia and founded leading destinations, tourism destinations in Slovenia, to digitize at least 3D examples of, cult of cultural heritage, but not only that. So we wanted to make an application out of it to create at least one tourist experience. And this is what happened around our country. Actually, um, we didn't even know what we are starting at that time. So it was uh, quite an interesting journey in which, as I already said, the destination got founded. spread all over the country. So it's really trying to create new attractions in spots which were not popular before. Combining very different kind of heritage, so rural areas, city centers, you will see industrial heritage, and really trying to make it you know, the right way because uh, there were no standards. We have been hearing today about standards. So we set a group of experts again. We tried to set the first standards to create high level 3D models, which can be really reused in time. Because we don't just, we don't want just to preserve. We are those who really want to try to bring this heritage to, you know, the second life to in games, in education, in tourism, entertainment, like, you know, really find new ways how to bring our roots to these new dimensions where we'll be living. You can see different kinds of heritage and then making free reconstruction castles around Slovenia. So three years ago, four years ago, it was nothing of that. So today we have all these images, all these animations, all this, and now we'll see what I said, the most important thing, new experiences where these 3D models are getting life again in new ways. Underwater heritage, so really, and this is the second part. So we have been running workshops with destinations, um, which have been like very challenging because at the beginning destination were against, actually against this, because this was something new, who wants to do this kind of projects where, you know, people who are dealing with promotion should deal with glasses, something, no, nothing is working, you know, complicating technology and so on. But now we can see all over Slovenia many uh, attractions. And, and as I said, we are reaching the, the goal that we are redirecting the tourist flows to the, to the points which were before not known to the tourists and also to local people. Just to give an idea of variety of projects that we're running. So we had projects uh, in AR, VR, holograms, um, interactive rooms, different mobile screens and so on. So really different uh, new media solutions that we've applied, always serving the end goal. So to pre present cultural heritage to tourists. And not to forget, as I said, setting the standards for a 3D model and making all these results visible or, or, or help uh, destinations to make them visible. This is a portal that we created then for the ministry where all these uh, 3D models can be seen and are linked to the attractions because we know that we, one can get a 3D model, but it's not easy, you know, how, how to make it presentable for, for the audiences and this not to forget these stages to really train stakeholders in the ecosystem, help them. So we develop learning materials, workshops, we have been with them, and maybe just like one of the impressions at the beginning, as I said, destination were like a, a little bit scared, feared. Then we, we invited experts, guests to like, for example, we had, a, you know, you see, 
You have people from tourism who like to sell, you know, the, the cultural heritage, and then those from museums who want to preserve it. So like a second or third workshop where we were like thinking, oh, oh my, they are going to fight now because it's like, mm, not good. <laughs> but at the end, uh, we can see, as, it, as I already said, that we created a portal where all these 3D models are, are, uh, view, um, can be viewed and linked to the destinations. But at the end, uh, you can see now the faces of all the nation getting awards, and they are like all very proud of these projects. They are they are uh, asking for new foundings to do that. So, first ideas, first steps are always the most difficult ones. But now we can see that it's the beginning is hard. But when you start it, it come it starts rolling. And I hope that in this room today we find this energy you know and the skills that we start rolling this ball and then reach the goals that we want to reach within europe and as we already heard today there are so many results so many effects in the ecosystem so on the local level and on a large level that we have learned that are there and if we do it on an even larger you know scale then this the, the effects will be even even um bigger and now so how to do that how to start this ball rolling Mateusz is, I'm like really happy that I can work with this type of experts such as Mateusz, who is really helping us and our team and uh, everyone in Slovenia to do this uh, way. So I hope that like, I leave you in your hands that you bring also this expert today on the way to the digitalization of European cultural heritage. Thank you. Can you move to the next slide? Yes, I can, or I can give you the power <laughs> as you want. <laughs> Can we, you wanted to say something in between? No. So now we are moving into the second part, but since we are the same presenters, it's in a way a continuation yeah, yeah, we're ready. Of, yeah. the, of the previous Just go one. with the flow. Um, so as Urka said, the, how, how do you start something like that in your own country? Um, back then, when we were starting, we didn't really know, of course, how to do it, and we didn't have a plan. We just jumped in. In a way, I think this is a good, uh, good uh, strategy. Um, once you're in there, you need to find the solutions. If you try to plan everything in advance, then, then you stop at the beginning. Um, so today in this uh, next few, um, in this, this next session, uh, we want to engage with you as well. So we will be using Mentimeter. Um, so um, this is like a uh, yeah, call for you to, to bring out your phones. You can go to menti.com, uh, sign in that number, um, and you should see some questions later Get your later pencils, on. because we prepared something for you, so you have from homework today. Yeah. Uh, I'll show that number later on, uh, but just... Um, and yeah. you can see the number, like, on the, on the slides, the following slides, so don't worry. Yeah, yeah on top. Um, so coming back to the morning discussions about the recommendations, um, and uh, we've set ambitious goals. Um, we've put together a map with uh, and writing out the, the numbers, the goals, uh, which indeed now seem rather ambitious. Um, also, if we go through, through all of them, um, of course, some countries more, some less, um, but still ambitious goals. Uh, I think uh, we should not be scared of these numbers, um, and we should not think at this moment uh, we won't reach them anyway so we will make an excuse at the end you know and it's not high school right um so um no, you used to huh? yeah. yeah okay um we have the first question for you um uh, looking at those goals uh just a question how how close to the goals are you uh so this is the target the tar target values for 2030 uh, and I ask Tamara if you can start the, the menti. Perfect. We are combining different technologies here. It's like a lab, okay? So <laughs> <laughs> please uh, excuse if not work, it's not working everything, but it should, right? Yeah, so here we go. Okay. And when you have when you say I have no idea, meaning you're not the one who should know that, or? I think you should use the mic, right, with, uh, for the questions with the audience. Is any mic wrong? 
Okay, coming. No, I can do that. You, you are the guy there. <clears throat> sorry. Uh, six. Uh, six. Yeah. Sorry. I have this. Okay. So does anyone want to comment on that? Who said I have no idea? For example. Okay, Harry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I understand, but <laughs> uh, whom would you ask, or what? Do you, we just want to, you know, people who have no idea. What would you you want to do? You know, it's something which is your mission too. Uh, I, I'm sorry. Okay. I have no idea yet. <laughs> I would say I have no idea yet uh, because uh, in November we'll be asking uh, member states to report on progress with the implementation and then we will have a, they should have an idea, right? a very good okay. idea uh, based, based on, of course, what the member states report. Thank you. So actually this question was just to, to see and this is pretty much, you see, the reality that we have in Europe and we have to start moving around it. And today is the first day that we will try to do. So how to reach these goals? Exactly. So today we want to give you a few hints how we would do it if we would uh, be commissioned to do it. Uh, of course, it's always easier to tell others how things should be done than, than doing it. But of course, in Slovenia, we also have these um, uh, ambitious goals and we also, as Slovenia, need to, to do quite a lot. Um, so uh, today we prepared like a fact sheet, no, not a fact sheet, like a worksheet for you, um, where we've tried to, in a way, help you think what to do. And the end goal of today's session is that at the end, you have three, uh, three steps that you will take once you get back home from Stockholm. And some help for you when you talk to other stakeholders to make them understand what is this about and how yeah. to deal with this topic, right? So for those of us listening us online, you can access this, uh, this uh, sheet on the uh, link down here below. Uh, it's tourism for uh, minus. minus o dot or IG slash heritage slash 3D journey. Um, and uh, yes, um, my first thoughts would be how to start it. Um, I would always try to think what is the long-term vision. And for me, the KPI, the number is not a long-term vision. I mean, this is something that needs to be achieved. The long-term vision is how do we want the, our future to look like and the future of uh, our children um, and of course how this, these activities will benefit the society as a whole, the economy and so on and so on. Um, so we are thinking of these, the impact that we will generate with that. So it's not about the KPI, it's the larger effects of this KPI. Uh, and of course we have to think cross-sectoral in, in this thing. Um, we, the one working in cultural heritage, will have to work with others um, because they will be using our um, our materials as well. Um, and our experience is that one organization or one institution cannot do this alone. Um, of course, not in Europe, not even within a separate country. Um, we need to decentralize these efforts. We need to engage a lot of uh, organizations, but we need to ensure uh, common standards and protocols. And of course, make a balanced mix of different types of objects. Before in the morning, we've been discussing, discussing what type of objects uh, we do first and how, how, uh, how to do this. Um, of course, probably to reach these numbers, we will need a combination uh, of them. Uh, today, we will be showing you most of the materials from Slovenia, which are rather large uh, objects of immovable cultural heritage. Um, and yes, doing it smaller objects might be a little bit uh, simpler. Um, as I said, it's, this journey is going to be a combination of um, different expertise, different um, uh, knowledge uh, providers, also uh, different aspects of looking at the same things. So really keep that uh, in mind. And as, as Urška said in the previous uh, part, in Slovenia, when we had this, uh, this experience, 
it's not always easy for different um, different stakeholders. fields stakeholders to work together um, unless they have a common goal um, in Slovenia we did a we, we went through that we went through all of these activities uh, with uh, with people who had no idea what is 3d and what is uh, digitization or digitalization or digital transformation um, so we've put all these things together in a tool uh, toolkit for them um, that might be useful for other countries as well um, so today we will be using some of the materials that we made back then and some of the materials that we have um, made just for this occasion to in a way tell you how these things uh, are done uh, or how we do it uh, probably there are other approaches as well um, so yeah uh, so uh, a 3d model first of all uh, let's be clear a 3d model is not 360 degree image so that's a main uh, main difference 360 degree image like the one that you see in street view of a popular website um, is is an image and we will now show one image of that room in 360 degree will it work we can do it <laughs> i can do it no 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 <laughs> we can do it he needs to switch yeah okay ah, so this go. is 360 degree image taking taken two hours earlier um, with a camera so it's an image that is warped uh, in a bubble right we cannot move within that image uh, it's just a two-dimensional image warped around the camera a 3d model is something different um, a 3d model um, is something that we can move within it so it's not an image it's actual it's the same as we experience this experience it as, as humans in a natural environment right it's 3d space um, and there are two main approaches of how to make a 3 3d model um, there are other as well but let's say that also today we've mostly heard about these two um, and in our company we mostly use photogrammetry combined with laser scanning so photogrammetry is the main approach that's why i started photogrammetry and then uh, we add laser scanning so it starts at the field um, it starts by taking lots of uh, images as we have seen in previous presentations um, on different uh, settings in different conditions um, we use for large buildings of course we use uh, lots of drones we use also normal, normal cameras and as in every natural environment we have also challenges there like forests next to the buildings or actually for or actual buildings put in a forest um, so the drones and of course the ones operating the drones have to be quite good at um, managing that there's also um, like uh, lots of work already on the site but the main idea is of course that we capture an, an object or a building from several sites um, as many times as possible uh, of course more images that there are uh, the better the quality it will be but of course at some point we need to limit ourselves and there's always of course this is a technical discussion at what point we limit ourselves so um, maybe to show you how we do that we have here an um, an object which is the which is a 3d printed 3d model of a 3d scanned the oldest it's 3d <laughs> okay. the oldest uh, musical instrument in the world um, and it actually shows that the neanderthal people uh, were not as uh, backward as we might think of them it actually shows that they had culture because they had music um, so yeah this is a 3d print of a 3d model which was 3d scanned and the original is in the national museum in, and it uh, was Ljubljana. found in slovenia i forgot yeah 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 in my municipality <laughs> <laughs> so um, can you see the yeah so i will now be using um, an app uh, which is there are several apps that can be used for that um, in our company we don't use these apps we do it the old-fashioned way we had we have other um, softwares but this is just to demonstrate how things are done so basically the idea is as I said previously uh, we take as many pictures as possible 
Here I won't take lots of them, but the idea is, you know, we capture the, the object from several sides and now I, my hands are shaking, so maybe this is not the best for taking pictures. Okay, we stop. And um, now I did something in three minutes that our guys would probably do in two days. Um, but then we start the processing of uh, the processing of these images. Um, so these all images are put together, coming from different sources. If you had different uh, different uh, drones or if you have different cameras, they need to be organized. And usually, it's thousands of photos for the objects that we do. Uh, what to do with these images? These images need to be. Oops. These images need to be edited because, as in every image, there is a part that is, let's say, in the shadow. Uh, so, huh? no. Something missing, or no. ah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so every image needs to be edited um, to avoid these. Um, parts that are in the shadow or over uh, overexposed to, to sunlight. Uh, you see there are parts that are not visible now, but once we edit them, there are visible parts. So this is the preparatory part, um, which is uh, rather um, unpleasant if you have thousands of images. And of course, software can help, but it doesn't really help all the way, right? Um, and then we move to the next step where we put these images together. So the idea is that each of the images that we took is an overlap with the previous image. So we overlap two images, add another one, another one, and another one, and we are searching for common points where they are, in a way, overlapping and where they are um, the same. And this is how the first uh, point cloud is made. So point cloud is actually a cloud um, of points, um, so points in a 3D space. Um, and it might look like that one. This one is with 23 million points, uh, a castle in Slovenia, or like that. Um, so now we are moving through a point cloud. This is not a 3D model yet. Uh, we need to be clear here. So this is a, a point cloud. It's a one step before. Um, and the laser scanner actually generates a similar point cl cloud as we are looking now. So laser, laser scanner is um, skipping these first parts of editing the images and brings in uh, point cloud already. The next step is, of course, to, cr to connect these uh, dots in a space um, with lines. And if you imagine if you have two lines, two dots, you have a line. If you have three dots, you have a triangle. If you add another dot, you have two triangles and so on. So this is how a, then a mesh is created, uh, a mesh of uh, polygons. On that mesh, we need to add. Um, so this mesh could already be um, in silver color or in gray color or something like that. Um, but on, ta on top of that, we need to add the texture. So the texture is what we call this uh, layer of uh, images put around it, uh, which makes it colorful, which, make, which makes it photorealistic. And of course, the more images that we had in the beginning, the more photorealistic that uh, final object could be. Uh, here, the question arises is, how do we um, ensure the accuracy of what we do? So what if we did, did all of these things, but then the 3D model is not, is let's say it's um, stretched a little bit more into one side because I don't know, there, the, the, the perspective of the camera was different or, some, or something like that. So this is why what we do, um, but there are also other approaches, uh, we bring the geometra with us, um, the surveyor, land surveyor, uh, who basically is gonna measure the physical object, and we will then compare the physical object to the digital one. Um, on the physical object, then we have to put basically lots of uh, we call them markers, um, and the geometra, the uh, surveyor, will basically measure the points of these uh, markers in the physical space, 
but these markers will be visible also in the digital um, model. So then we can basically compare them if they are, if the distances between them are the same. And if um, the more we have, of course, the more accurate it will be. Um, this is how a 3D model, we've generated a 3D model. Now the issue is how do we show it to people? If basically I send any of you a 3D model that we did, probably on your own computers, you will not be able to open it because it's just too large file. Uh, you, you would need a special software for, uh, to do it. And this is why we use uh, online viewers, like user, uh, viewers in a browser where uh, one can basically um, see a 3D model on a normal computer with a normal knowledge. And this is one of the uh, viewers that we've developed um, in the Vive project together with Europeana and some other partners as well um, that could be uh, used for such occasions. As we already said in the morning, metadata is super important because metadata tells us and tells other people what this 3D model is about and what we actually did in that case. Uh, so metadata is a data about uh, a data. Um, there's also another term that is used in that uh, field, it's paradata. So paradata is the technical data about the, the model. Um, and if you remember when you have your own phones, your own uh, your, or your cameras, your camera creates paradata about the images that you took. And in the case of 3D model, it's something similar. Um, so yeah, we show these things to, to the wider publics. As Urška said, we did it in Slovenia with a separate uh, website where we embedded the viewer that we've shown uh, before. Um, and uh, this is how a 3D model is made. And let's see if we made it. Can we change the... Um, so we have now here a 3D model of that flute. It's the Neanderthal flute, it's the official name. Um, and you see here what we could do is, of course, we would need to cut that stand below. We could we'd need to cut the, the surface below. Here we took 21 images. So if we took much more images, of course, the details would be would better. But it's right for, for a three minute work, it's quite OK. Um, shaking hands, it's huh? for the shaking hands. It's the yeah. Result, <laughs> So yeah, it's not that hard. And uh, again, if you prepare everything correctly, if uh, you have the right um, equipment, um, and of course, if the object is easy to scan, then, then things are OK. Um, what to do then? Um, we believe that here, the story should not stop. And for us, um, it never stops here because in a way it's just hard to look at a 3D model on a USB stick in a drawer in an office or something like that. For us, a 3D model needs to be used and it needs to be used several times in different settings for different purposes. Um, because this is what, as I said in the beginning, this is now where the vision uh, comes into play, right? What we will do with it and how it will transform um, the society, the economy, and so on. So there are several uses of uh, 3D models. Um, the simplest one, of course, we create a video of uh, this 3D model, and we incorporate that video into a promotional uh, video or, or interpretation video, or basically whatever. Um, or um, we just play this 3D model in a hologram. A hologram is a device that is um, using 2D technology, so it's using screens or projections. But at the end, the, the effect looks like it's 3D, so it looks like it's in front of you. Um, and this is a project that we did in um, the southeastern, southeastern part of Slovenia, where the idea was to present seven castles um, in a room that we call a digi digital room. Um, the same 3D model could be used uh, in a virtual reality experience. So we could populate that 3D model with additional stuff, historical things, uh, with uh, characters, with weather, uh, with the facts. So we actually make it look lively, uh, look um, realistic. 
And in that case, yeah, we developed uh, a virtual reality game where you uh, wander around the castle and you uh, get to know the different stories that happened in that castle. Um, yeah, I'll skip. Uh, or instead of virtual reality, we could use it in augmented reality. Um, so augmented reality is something that is uh, a reality that is put on top of the our physical ex existing reality and where people can uh, see something that is not visible in the nature. Um, as I said previously, these technologies, of course, could be combined. There are also other technologies and other media that could be used. Um, in some cases, for example, we print that these 3D models and then we use the 3D models as a canvas to project something on them. Again, we are, we are transforming a 3D model into something that is uh, not static, that is not just a depiction of a building at a certain uh, time, um, but it's bringing um, yeah, content into it. And uh, now I want to build uh, on this is because we have been uh, talking already about data spaces for tourism, data spaces for cultural heritage. So reuse that we are now like envisioning or working on is that uh, we are partner in one of the data spaces for tourism projects dates and the two projects will merge. So there will be only one blueprint at the end. And it's not only about making interviews with you know, cultural uh, heritage sector. No, there, for example, there, uh, we plan to make use cases. And what we are preparing is at least one use case in this blueprint will be about cultural heritage and digitalization, reuse of it. So all these like demo projects somehow put them in the future and how to create seamless tourist experiences, just calling from these are different databases, the 3D models or whatever models, or whatever data and so on. Um, for example, we are also part of a consortium in um, digi uh, digital uh, uh, data space for media. We were not mentioning. So there are so many sectors where we can reuse this. We are always bringing this application reuse because we believe these 3D models need a second life in this new reality that we are creating. Um, yeah, and I yeah, give the word just to back stress to what you yeah. said, long-term vision and how will we use it uh, again? Ad and when, you, when we start thinking like that, it's not about that number there that needs to be no. reached, it's about the effects uh, later on. Um, so, okay, now I stopped Let's my Let's go part. working together, yeah. right? Um, so, I know that in many cases, it's not you personally who are responsible for achieving that number, that KPI. But again, we are not in high school where everybody tries to avoid the, the responsibility. There is no, I have no idea <laughs> in the room. Um, I think everyone can contribute and uh, should contribute somehow. Uh, so we really <clears throat> ask you also for think how reaching that goal would help you or your organization. Um, um, of course, work differently or work better. Um, to remind you, the the so you can use this sheet for yeah. just like trying to visualize how your institution, your country yeah. could reach the goal. Uh, by the way, there will be no test at the end. So what you no, write you on the... You should tell that, you know. Just, <laughs> what you no write stays then. with you, so... <laughs> <laughs> but there will be, she said that there will be a revision, right, coming, so... <laughs> yeah, but it's not going to be no, not us, to us no. judging, right? <laughs> we are the good guys, we want to help you. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, okay. Um, no. I've seen that uh, many of you... Oh, uh, yes. Okay. okay. Um, Tamara, can you start the... Uh, and of course, whenever there's a hard uh, deadline or hard KPI uh, coming or approaching, we should think who will we work with? I mean, it, as I said, one of us won't reach the, the goals by himself or by herself. So we need to always work with uh, some others. Do we so. have a representative from Ministry of Culture here that I know one are ah, here also? So as you can see, like the main player in these processes, for example, if the processes Ministry of Culture, how do you see the development here? We already heard you, but would you comment on this or please? 
Well, uh, of course, the, the Minister of Culture is, is responsible for the, the policy in this area, and that will sort of guide the, the cultural heritage institutions. Do you have a kind of dialogue with other ministries on this topic? Yes, we have. For example? Yeah. For example, the Edu Ministry of Research and Education mm -hmm. uh, and the Ministry uh, of fin Finance, uh, currently in, in charge of the overall digital um, policies. Uh, we have a representative here in the room okay. as well. Yeah. Thank you. May I ask for Austria? <laughs> Our neighbors. Um, hi, so from Austria, I think, uh, of course, the ministries for culture have a very strong role in uh, setting an example in setting up their policies, uh, both on state level as well as regional level to facilitate uh, 3D digitization and digitization in general. Wherever there is a ministry for digitization, and we have seen here that uh, that point has been given three points approximately, um, collaborations between ministries uh, are also incredibly important. And wherever uh, it always depends on how states are set up and how governance is set up, uh, regions and municipalities have a great role to play. But in the end, uh, I think digitization efforts are also uh, very dependent on grassroots ideas and ideas from bottom up, from citizens, from the institutions that are involved with our cultural heritage to really um, get it out in, digital, in the digital space, uh, preserving it, presenting it, and reaching their audience uh, in each member state, but also in Europe and even further in the whole world. And what do you say in Austria, this dialogue is do you see it as a good one or it's like... In Austria, we have a very strong dialogue in that uh, sector and uh, especially with uh, EU funding and the next generation EU. Uh, we are very active in that respect and hope to achieve our targets and uh, also inspire our institutions to gain the skills, hone their skills and uh, really get on board with digitization efforts. Thank you very much. Anyone else that would comment on this? Okay, we have other questions. Don't worry, everyone will come. <laughs> Should we move on, right? Uh, yeah. Or do we want to come and comment something here? We, we see that we have different players in... Okay, we will. So we were wondering, you said that one of the important things is to have standards set up, because this tells us how, what are we actually doing and what's the end result? Okay, no, yes. Okay, yeah, for sure. Thank you. So uh, the question I wanted to ask is, what were the standards on 3D that uh, you agreed on uh, before uh, embarking on this uh, uh, project? Uh, you ask, you're asking us? Okay, <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Yep, yep, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, once we started, um, of course, we also had the same uh, situation in, in Slovenia. Um, and we've, in a way, got together different experts from the industry, from the Ministry of Culture as well, um, and prepared one of our own. I'm not saying that they're the best ever possible, but in that moment, we needed them, and, and this is how we, we prepared them. Um, what we've throughout the development, what we've seen is that, of course, technology is developing really fast and the standards in a way get, um, yeah, they're not so high quality anymore. I mean, they're not uh, aiming at high quality. Um, so, of course, now we are updating them regularly. Uh, this is an activity done as part of the re research and development project that we are running with uh, universities um, for the state, but they are not official Ministry of Culture uh, standards. It's like a body that was yeah, suggesting because the municipalities and or destinations needed something for the procurements, you know, to set some standards, how to choose the... Yeah. Yeah. 
question. Uh, so looking at the, the, the graph, uh, the chart here, uh, would the standard that you agreed on or the one that you're updating uh, be useful for um, others who would like to establish such standard or is it something that different countries would need to uh, put together based on their own needs or uh, what, what would you see what as you most say? appropriate? <laughs> Um, we have to have in mind that here we were talking about immovable cultural heritage, so they're biased towards dealing with large buildings. Uh, I think that if we work with smaller, much smaller objects, of course, different uh, standards should be set, but I think they're a starting point to, to start the discussion. And we believe we need one for Europe, right, because this would help Otherwise, we will have a mess. This is what we... Yeah. Yes, please. Yes. Um... Oh, I can give you. Sorry? Yes. Um, congratulations, first of all. Um, and secondly, I will advise the 47 persons, colleagues, I will say, to download <laughs> and read carefully the study results. Uh -uh. This is what we are doing here. It's amazing. And if we want to keep it, preserve it on a long term, then we have to take care that those who are going to read it, to learn about the past, are able to do that. Mm -hmm. Setting, a, let's say, an approach and a goal for 2030 Documenting the tangible past of Europe is good, but if we go in this way, mm. mission failed, and the study it was fully sponsored, it's under gold open access, please download that. It will help Slovenia a lot. That's the first one statement. The second one, do you know that UNESCO is now starting to do similar uh, project as Europeana, but for the entire world, we are a part of UNESCO too. So having that in mind, please let us try to be at least on a yeah, worldwide standardized way when we are trying to digitize the past, the memory huh, of our grandfathers. Thank you. Yep, we, as I said, Europe and yeah, at best the whole world. Um, just, uh, it was a tweet from UNESCO following one of our uh, tweets this morning, showing statistically that the EU is leading in this particular area. Mm -hmm. And if it's all about EU investment for leading so far as knowledge concern, that's the challenge. And we have to take care now so that standards are in place. We cannot document the past without having a grammar and semantic rules in place. It's impossible, at least, to define what identity is. Thank you. I, I know it's um, unpleasant to be the two um, compared to the rest, but I really want to know about these two uh, that, that said yes. <laughs> ah, okay. <one> of them. <laughs> His voice is for I two. Thought that. <laughs> I don't know who is <laughs> Somebody online? Okay, so they're not. Yeah, okay. But it would be really, really good to know if there's another country um, so that, whoever has an idea on that, so please, whatever, just contact us. We are really yeah, willing yeah. to hear. Let's move on. Otherwise, we will run out of time. OK. And, and as we were always saying, it's not about the KPI. It's about how are we going to use and reuse them. Um, we have a question for you. In what um, fields outside of cultural heritage, so we are now talking about outside of cultural heritage, uh, you think they could be useful? To what extent, actually? And of course, then we will ask you to give us examples where you, in your cases, it was already done, it was already used. We want to hear these 
examples. Anyone? Otherwise, I come to you, so. Oh, okay. So I can't really say anything about 3D models in cultural heritage, but uh, the Austrian aggregator Kulturpool has its most reuse actually in the educational sector with uh, teachers using the material uh, given uh, and prepared already in their lessons to educate our children. Okay, other examples? You wanted to say that we run out of time? Or no, <laughs> no not at all. <laughs> Hello. Yep. Is this on? Yes. Yep. Okay. So um, the the cultural tourism example is one I really like. I grew up in Bruges, um, the historical medieval city in Belgium, um, and one of the things that I see visited the most in Bruges are these um, kind of. Uh, they're, they're huge poles that stand in the center of a, of a square and it has a 3D glass in it that you can look into and then you can turn okay. around. So it's more of a 360 image. Um, they are the biggest attraction in Bruges. I see lines of, of people in front of that attraction more than the people that want to visit the Belfry and, and, and want to go up and down. Um, to me, there's a huge potential to, to use this. You can really see the, so they have recreated a medieval scene of, this, um, mm. of, of these squares, uh, the way they were in the 12th and, and 13th centuries. And the fact that they are in the public space, that they take our public space um, and people can just discover them without even knowing that they were there or planning for them, that to me is a, is a, a really great uh, potential for reuse um, in cultural tourism. Okay, anyone else? Because when one hears the example of others, then gets ideas on home. Maybe a comment on cultural tourism or on tourism and 3D. Um, for those of you who are um, following the metaverse discussions, whether we like the term or not, um, I think with metaverse, we've seen how countries that were previously not um, in these um, discussions or in these developments really made very uh, a lot of uh, steps forward. I'm here especially talking about the uh, the Gulf countries, mm -hmm. um, the in Asia, um, how we how all that development of course goes there, and they're recreating whole islands in 3D in what they call metaverse, uh, of course, in uh, made out of made up uh, places, and I think here is where Europe can in a way uh, be uh, in front of them because we. Once we have these 3D models, we could, we could make a metaverse that is not a imaginary uh, space um, with imaginary characters, uh, but it's a, a place that is actually a replica of the real world. Because I don't want to live in a world where we will be putting on glasses and virtual living in a, a, a world that is not the actual world as the one outside, and especially if thinking of the climate change and so on, that that would be an escape from the real world. Um, so, yeah. So you want, you want the other way around. So, for example, taking 3D models, not one of the projects, combining with satellite images that we really get digital twins of this and what, how they are changing in time. And if you want to create a game, make it like real. Okay, so interesting, but real, getting real data and so on. Yeah. Okay, let's move on, otherwise. Yeah, we're... maybe just a comment on the uh, construction works. Uh, I think before what uh, Marco from Inception was pointing out, this is really how these two fields that are maybe not the most uh, uh, natural partners, or mm. let's say, or not at least not seen like that, how they can work together, right? Um, okay, and the question, as we already mentioned in the morning, um, where all of that data will be stored? This is the final question, because if it's not stored or if it's stored on a USB stick in a drawer, then if I talk to my technical mm. colleagues at our mm. company, this it's not stored at all. So we, we saw great pictures from Europeana, the role of Europeana. So what, what do you think? Uh, Where Tamara, will can you this free data? Start it? Ah, perfect, thank you. Here you just write like what you think. It's a word cloud. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, 
Ah, it's showing the wrong question in the... Okay. Okay, now it's coming. <clears throat> oh, okay. Someone was serious. <laughs> Anyone wants to comment on that? Mateusz wants, I know, but <laughs> yeah, 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 please. Yeah, I want to <clears throat> bring up a point uh, that came up at a conference two weeks ago, and also we were speaking a bit after dinner about it, uh, and that is the the file formats that we're using today, with the raw files and, and 3D uh, files. If in 50 years somebody would like to open this data, how will they be able to open it? Mm. Uh, so one idea is uh, I don't remember who suggested it a couple of weeks ago, but but to to store disk images of our computers today that someone could go in and operate later. But then it's a question of software licensing, etc., for those companies um, to to make it available that we can store a disk image and and actually operate our files in the future. Also connecting to that, what do we store? Is it just the final 3D model or it's all the images, the thousands of images before the 3D model? Is yeah, there? I mean, it depends if you're doing laser scan, all you have is the raw, sure. raw yeah. scan, but for photogrammetry, I mean, I started photogrammetry 13 years ago and we were like, we have to store the data because in 10 years we'll have even better software algorithms to, to process. And it, um, obviously it came true. So, I mean, in another 10 years, we'll have even better uh, algorithms. Yeah. So. Might as well start the list. Here, the discussion is also like we were in Hack, I don't know, two weeks ago, I think, or like data space, all data spaces sectors met. And it was um, the question was where to put the focus on storing or on reuse, you know, so that we go away from thinking about storing because 80% of data are not reused. So we are store, like, you know, saving, storing, blah, 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 but not reuse. So how to actually think of scenarios, how to reuse the data and then make the like solution where to store. Yeah, I, this is not the solution. It's just how to uh, discussions that are, that are running about. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And uh, uh, super interesting what Mike was saying. I do agree that uh, reworking data in the next future can allow us to uh, create even more accurate 3D model. And for sure, I think that data storing is uh, the, the, the most important question and is strictly related with the uh, reuse. Um, there are a lot of uh, local storage or no storage, let's call it even in that way, that could become available if we define which are, which are the reuse scenarios, uh, also in terms of licenses and uh, way to use them. And at the same time, I think we should reflect on uh, the, the, the topic of the data sovereignty, uh, because most of the time, uh, if an institution owns their own data, I, I see that that uh, Sketchfab is among the options, but uh, uh, if we are delivering our data to Sketchfab, we are not keeping them and we are not preserving them. So, um, but even for institution, it's quite difficult to uh, set up a, a data storage uh, on uh, their own. So thinking about uh, infrastructure that could help us all to store data is uh, of utmost importance, I think. Maybe a comment on that. As in your personal lives, I think everyone should distinguish between a storage place and a communication channel. So I, I use, I also post photos of myself and what I do on social media, but I don't regard this as a storage space. I have them stored somewhere else. So. I'm not against using these social media platforms, but I'm, it's, they're not a storage place. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, one thing that comes to mind is that cultural heritage institutions should be uh, probably the, the most suited uh, organizations of all to uh, approach the long-term storage uh, of data, uh, just bringing on the general idea of storing collections uh, for, the, uh, for eternity. And I mean, it's still the same idea, it's just a different way of doing it, but, but it takes into uh, consideration a lot of new things to do for example storing uh, images we have uh, the first digitized objects are now 40 years old uh, I have a few of that, those computers at home and they are readily available for emulation etc I think there will be less interested uh, people in emulating Windows 11 computers from the 2022 uh, than Commodore 64, for example. But uh, still, there are those things to be taken into consideration. I think museums and cultural heritage institutions are really readily avail uh, suited for that, to be in the forefront of those questions. May I ask one question, because we are coming to the conclusion. Uh, what would you say for you when you go out now would be the first three steps that you, like in your position, would take now to help these things? Uh, so for, for yeah, me, uh, yeah. I wrote down, uh, I take my yeah. uh, note here. Uh, first of all, I think that we need to work with uh, the uh, setting the clear goal. I think you had a great vision uh, and that was obvious and it was also inclusive. Uh, not just what we are doing, but what we are doing. Um, so that that's one thing we need to work on. And also uh, putting into the, the concept of, of preservation and, and uh, the perspective of eternity into digitization, because I think that will help the institutions to form the right, right mindset. So I think those two are interlinked and it will, I don't know exactly how to approach them, but that will be uh, my food for thought. Okay, thank you. You wanted to add something? Of course. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I will say first thing is to skill, skill the multidisciplinary um, society, uh, users, why it is so important to take care of the three digitization of the past um, so that they can do it correct when it comes. Secondly, we have to distinguish between a digital tweet or a memory tweet. And that's not so easy in this digital century and the time of the digital transformation, setting uh, big targets um, as the recommendation um, with the goal of 2030, as you presented earlier. And the third one, we have to take care to collaborate with UNESCO. Please, please, European Commission, I do know that UNESCO is sitting with us on the same round table. We have to sit together, and as European Union, we have to take care to help and support UNESCO. UNESCO is on our ground, it's in Paris. It's not so far away from Brussels. So, so that once when this Europe data space will be really created and run or the european cloud yeah on cultural heritage to be a unified uh, and so well running um, it's going to be very bad for the european union if and in case we have two systems running from 27 member states yeah eu yeah who which are at the same time members of the unesco and there is not a full compatibility with that what is going to run under unesco in the dive into heritage project it's extremely important and as a good advice please contact your national unesco national committee this is what you do for europeana you can give it also to unesco it's nice and try to do that in the same way so that there is a compatibility there, yeah? yeah and congratulations in... to Sans once again. Oh, thank you. Well, we are in contact, but I have to say that the innovation was not so going so fast there, right? Or maybe, yeah. So that's, that's, that's the error. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Any other comments? I will come back to you anyway. So if anyone, <laughs> because I want to just maybe a closing remark on free tech steps. This was the, for you, like after this discussion, it's nothing new for you, but maybe just now yeah, well, today. Uh, it's true that, um, you know, if, if I have the heart of the, you know, of my unit in yeah, the commission, yeah, sure. uh, then it's, uh, it's different next three steps uh, that we can do because it's uh, for us because it's about uh, coordinating mm -hmm. uh, this uh, and um, first of all I would like to thank you very much for this because it helps uh, the goals uh, everyone's goals a lot I think and it can be followed up for sure um, next three steps well to take home <laughs> let's say is uh, yeah the um, well, the standards we dis you, you, I mean mm. how do we proceed with that the storage also how do we proceed with that and uh, of course uh, collaboration how do we um, uh, facilitate uh, the continuation of these uh, um, yeah exchanges and maybe yeah taking a practical and pragmatic approach uh with uh concrete um um uh, goals i would not say targets because it, it can it can confuse uh, uh but yes concrete goals and and next steps in the different organizations that, that's what i thank you thank you anyone else then mateus uh, one more no okay yeah, we have three more I, yeah yeah, oh, yeah. i want I if you want to yeah. The, yeah almost the last slide is it? Yeah, I wanted if you want to uh, make some final yes step. or we concluding have, words. Have I have a, mine. So we, <laughs> I just we have quite with. a lot of things to do in Slovenia. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course, we have a lot of things to do yeah, in Slovenia. Yeah. Anyway, what we wanted, I ho we hope that we showed you the way, one of the ways that you can do deal with this, that you have the idea a little bit clear what 3D models is and that how these things uh, work in reality, that you got the inspiration that we are not doing 3D models, we are doing a new reality, building a new reality. We can make Pokemons or we can take these roots, our history, and bringing to this reality for us, for our, for our children. Yeah, this is like my mission because uh, this is the reality where we will and our next generation are going to, to live in. And this is now this part of development. If we do it now, we will do it. Otherwise, these things we see with wars and whatever just get destroyed. And this, the other uh, world invented by some figures is growing so fast that we will never catch this development. So now is the last second, you know, really to jump on this train and bring this, I said, this reality, this new metaverse, whatever. Um, and, and as we, yes. as we also had the experience in Slovenia. Before we started, we didn't have all the answers. And I think we, it was good that we didn't wait for all the answers. We, we started. And on the way, we were, of course, developing Jump. solutions. It's cold. You swim. Yeah. It's... <laughs> um, and uh, I think in many of your cases, it should be similar. And we are here, of course, to help. Yeah. Our so one good thing is that whatever you need, you have our contacts, you can contact us, you can call us also just to share your frustrations. It's okay, it's part of the process. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also from other for other devices. So thank you for your attention and yeah. have a nice day. You can put it down there. Thank you so much, Urska and Mateus. Uh, it's nice to know where we can yeah. have a shoulder to cry on if needed. Uh, I'm sure we all need that uh, at one point. And thanks to everyone for being so engaged, for answering questions, for being part of the Mentimeter. Um, I also see Urska and Mateus, there's been a lot of interaction online. We're going to save the chat so all of the impressions that people had and notes that people have taken. Uh, you'll be able to look at as well. Uh, people have shared how they have done 3D digitization, their own projects. So we've got a lot of uh, engagement on Zoom as well. So, and thank you online for that too.
Um, I can't believe we're slowly getting towards the end of uh, today already. We have, uh, of course, some very uh, interesting guests to look at next. This is mostly uh, a, a short uh, online part where we have a few people doing some quick five-minute presentations, uh, after which we'll have a panel discussion. So all of the questions that come up in your head during the next uh, three presentations, keep them, and then we can ask those questions during the panel. We're going to start that panel with uh, Kate Fernie. Kate Fernie is Operations Manager at Carare. You're up on screen, Kate, so nice to see you. Thanks for being here. Um, Kate has led the Europeana Network Association's 3D Content Task Force, uh, where she helped develop guidelines for 3D content ingestion into European so uh, she's also very knowledgeable about this, especially in her work with Carare. Uh, Kate, the floor is yours to talk about 3D in archaeology practice. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to speak at the conference uh, today. I'm sorry that I can't be with you in Stockholm. Um, and can I see my slides? Um, I wanted to... Um, actually wanted to begin by saying that in practice, in professional field archaeology and recording historic buildings and in arch architecture in particular, um, the use of these types of digital technologies that we've actually heard so elegantly described by colleagues from Artur and others this morning are becoming increasingly common. Um, what we're facing with the um, European Commission's digitization challenge is a question of scale. Um, oh, thanks. Um, we, we're talking about very large numbers of monuments which are at risk of all different types of climate pressures, of uh, threats from uh, development, of degradation by standard environmental con conditions. So we're talking about lots of monuments, lots of data, lots of people. and. Uh, we spoke a little bit about um, issues around best practices and standards. There's a need for uh, the network to make connections, to share experiences. And um, so I wanted to introduce Karari, if I could have my next slide. So Karari has a special focus on archaeology and historic buildings. Um, we're a non-profit membership association and our members include a lot of the heritage agencies who are actually going out and doing digitization in 3D of um, monuments which are uh, nationally and internationally important or identified for protection. Um, so we set ourselves up with a mission of advancing professional practice and fostering appreciation of the digital archaeological and architectural heritage that's quite a challenge actually but uh, one which we're embracing uh, we're currently partners in several different projects which have strands around capacity building and if i could have the next slide um and these include the european common data space uh, or CH, the Competence Centre for Conservation, Preservation and Valorization of the um, Immovable Cultural Heritage, 5D Culture and Tech for Heritage. So within those various projects, we can see activities around uh, workshops on 3D data curation and virtual reality, training schools on the recording the archaeological heritage in 3D, educational workshops uh, focusing on primary and secondary school um, students. So also delivering a regular series of webinars around connecting archaeology and looking at the need for guidelines and video tutorials. On this slide, you can see a snapshot of a recent um, digitization workshop which took place in Iraq. Um, the students were lucky enough to um, go to Babylon and to learn practical techniques in doing 3D digitization using both the high-end technologies and also uh, smaller, easier to access technologies um, using uh, mobile phones and other types of photogrammetry uh, techniques. Um, 
But what we had was a, a, a structured program, a five day workshop where these students could get started in 3D digitization and then they will be going out across um, that region of Iraq, uh, digitizing monuments, capturing uh, 3D models and sharing that content, both with the Ministry of Antiquities and also um, eventually we hope with Europeana. So you will see that content. So I wanted to highlight this as an example of one of the ways of scaling up digitization activities uh, within a country where its um, heritage is under severe risk, both from climate change and also from um, terrorist threats. So I think if we can do it in Iraq, we can do it elsewhere in Europe. Um, and that's my, just got one final slide, I think. So that's my intro to the following uh, panel uh, session. And if you'd like to get in touch with me, I'd love to talk to you more. Lovely. Thanks Kate. very much. Thank you so much. And we'll come back to this uh, during the panel, but first we'll move on to Nicolo De Lunto, um, who will be talking about 3D data reuse and deep interaction to support archaeological practice. Uh, Nicolo is a professor of digital archaeology at the Department of Archaeology and Ancient History at Lund University. You're up on screen, Nicolo. Uh, the floor is all yours. Please go ahead. Hello, everyone. I'm very sorry not being here. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be part of this very interesting uh, discussion. So, um, yes, I, I work at Lund University and I coordinate the activities of the Lund University Digital Archaeology Laboratory, the Dark Lab. And Dark Lab is uh, a national infrastructure uh, focused on 3D visualization and spatial analysis. One of the labor laboratory main goals is to identify new methodologies for or new methods of uh, investigation for uh, by combining new basically digital methods, tools. The lab hosts several PhD students, postdocs, and various research projects, all focused on 3D visualization and spatial analysis. Uh, please, the next slide. <laughs> so Dark Lab is fully involved in higher education, supporting several international master students, master courses on 3D recording and visualization of archaeological sites and materials. We also organize seminars, we share educational materials, and we are part of the uh, Swedish National Infrastructure for Digital Archaeology, Sverig Ark. Um, next slide. Thanks. So we believe that 3D models are not really an end product, but rather a means of identifying new investigation practices. So simply sharing 3D models will not have a fundamental impact on cultural heritage. However, exploring the revolutionary practice that focus on the use of 3D models will create a bottom-up need to use such a data. So rather than formats and new platforms, I believe that effort must be made to identify new practices. The next slide, please. Um, yeah. So the limitation of digital collections as they've been conceived so far became apparent during the pandemic when these platforms were suddenly no longer just reference sources, but the only sources available for conducting research. So this situation underlined the urgent need to explore strategy for defining digital collection as a primary research tool and for fully supporting scholars working in the digital space. So for this reason, we have spent the last two years experimenting with new forms of digital interactions to map the impact of 3D collection on higher education and archaeological practice. Our research has highlighted the urgent need to understand how these data change and enhance our perception of the past directly affecting affecting our interpretation. So we need to learn how to engage with this data. We need to uh, not just to emulate uh, old style collection in the digital world, but we need to um, really transform those in tools that can allow us to reuse this data properly. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nicole.
Thanks again, Nicolo. Uh, our penultimate lightning talk is uh, by Antonella Freza. Uh, Antonella Freza is uh, the Director of Design and Implementation at the Promoter Digital Art Gallery, and she is the Vice President of the Photo Consortium Association. She'll be talking to us about Eureka 3D, a project I am a big fan of. So Antonella, I'm looking forward to your talk. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, very nice uh, to be with you online. Sorry to be not uh, in presence. It will be for the next time. Um, so you can uh, move to the first slide. Uh, in my presentation, I'm uh, trying to tell you that uh, Eureka 3D is a project that uh, is answering is providing some answers to the questions that have been posed until now during the conference today. Where do we store? It was a question from Mike. Uh, we need the highest possibility of quality. And this was a comment from Caterina. The cost of the storage and preservation is on Sketchfab, which is a private company, not even European. This was a comment from Jill. And the storage is not the same as a communication platform in the latest comment from Mateus. Well, in Eureka 3D, we are addressing these aspects because on the one side, we acknowledge that not all the cultural heritage institutions have in-house expertise. Uh, this means not only to be facilitated with an approach similar to the Museum of Hunt that we heard today, but also to have access to the storage and preservation infrastructure. Uh, the infrastructure, because the infrastructure in particular of the small museums is not ready to host 3D models. Uh, and uh, the, there is a variety of content with the complexity of information that needs to be tackled. And this variety of contents with the paradata and metadata needs to be standardized. We had uh, uh, similar uh, experiences uh, with the uh, archives uh, and the uh, PDF and TIFF, and there is a rather successful uh, project named Preform that was uh, financed in uh, FP7 by the European Commission about the preservation of the PDF and TIFF. Now we need to act towards preservation of 3D contents. But the first step for preservation is to agree on formats that needs to be open, as much open as possible. Next, please. And what can we rely on, on the recommendation from the Commission we heard today, on the work of Europeana, that is a partner in Eureka 3D, on the, in Europeana on the revision of the data model, the Europeana data model, uh, on the study, on the study, the VG study that was uh, described by Marinos today. And the VGA study is on the foundation of Eureka 3D. Uh, and the Cyprus University of Technology is a partner in Eureka 3D. But there is another element in Eureka 3D that is uh, has, uh, appearing as a, a, an actor in uh, the scenario that are the e infrastructures, the providers of the storage and computing, because the storage and computing is needed, and we wanted to have a storage and computing provided by European players. For this reason, in Europe. Eureka 3D, we have the EGI Foundation, the European Grid Initiative, funded by the European Commission to run the federation of cloud providers in Europe and the operator of the EOSC platform, the European Open Science Consortium, where all the services developed in Eureka 3D will be uh, registered. Next, please. Uh, 
The project has just started. We started on the 1st of January 2023 and will run for two years. It is coordinated by Photo Consortium that is one of the accredited aggregators of Europeana. Uh, we will run capacity building activities. Uh, there is a website where you can see our activities and you can get in contact with the consortium partners. The next event will be in Rome on the 6th of June, hosted by the Swiss Institute, that is one of the the University of Basel in Switzerland is one of the members of the Photo Consortium, and for this reason we enjoy uh, the hosting of the Swiss Institute in Rome. Uh, and we run a pilot. We run a pilot with different content providers at the different stages of uh, experience on 3D, from the most experienced uh, Cyprus University of Technology to the less experienced, the Museum of Paper with the bold uh, molds from uh, paper uh, molds uh, from the 1700 in Pesha, who has no experience on 3D digitization, to uh, archaeological site the, that uh, is the Bibracte Archaeological Research Center in uh, Morvan, in France, that has done a big campaign for digitizing their 3D excavations, but they are not yet present in Europeana. So different levels of experience, among which also uh, the municipality of the archive of the municipality of Girona that was a partner in WEAVE digitized photography in 3D. What does it mean? Uh, digitization of uh, uh, daguerreotypes with a lot of technical uh, um, problems to be solved about reflection. Antonella, Finished. You, uh... Next. <laughs> there we go. Next. <laughs> yes. I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up. You have it too, too fast. In the next slide, you have our content. Great. Thank you so much, Antonella. <laughs> And sorry for having to cut you off there. Our uh, last uh, lightning talk before we open the panel is by Baudouin Koopmans. Uh, Baudouin has been project manager for the Amsterdam Time Machine since 2022. He'll be talking to us about the 4D Research Lab. Baudouin, yes, we can see you. The floor is all yours. Thank you so much. I'm great to, to be with you, uh, uh, be it online. So dear visitors of this uh, beautiful conference of Europeana, my name is Boudewijn, project manager of the Amsterdam Time Machine, a research project of the University of Amsterdam. And in the next few minutes, I'm uh, going to show you why 3D matters to, to us. Next slide, please. Well, the journey of the time machine, uh, you uh, well, will, be, will have heard of, started back in 2013 with the uh, Venice time machine. And nowadays, the time machine comprises more than 600 organizations from 40 countries. And uh, Europeana is, of course, one of the uh, most foremost members. And it's the aim of the time machine to add new dimensions to the past. And we want people to be able to access the history of their city, their region, their family through connecting digital sources and add a layer of 3D representation. And this is what we call 5D. Time is a fourth dimension and big data as fifth. Next slide, please. Yeah. The city of Amsterdam is, well, where I'm based, will soon celebrate its 750 years of existence. And we want to combine all these data sources you see at the bottom in one big data hub and, uh, well, make applications on these uh, data for use in tourism, education, research, etc. And VR tools using 3D models will be very helpful to well, really immerse people uh, within the data we are going to uh, to show them. Next slide, please. Yeah, you can click. click the, yeah. Well, what we have uh, with uh, 3D, um, I will show you four uh, fields, four ways how we pursue the challenge of reconstructing 750 years uh, of Amsterdam history in 3D. Next slide, please. 
Yeah, at the University of Amsterdam, I'm part of a lab uh, where we look into the creative industries of the past. And we have, for example, a large database called Cinema Contacts, an uh, online encyclopedia and a research tool on Dutch cinema. And the research group of Professor Julia Noordegraaf wanted to reconstruct cinemas that no longer exist. What well, is one of the things you can see here? Next slide, please, because we want to look inside. You can click one more time and see Modern Times by Charlie Chaplin from 1936 on your screen a film that was screened uh, in this cinema. We only miss the rumor of the people and maybe the smell. So next slide, please. Um, we have also a lot of students here at the university. Um, a small chunk yet uh, you is using digital methods. Uh, for example, uh, the uh, software tool Blender. This is a result of a master course called the, the Digital City, in which the students have reconstructed parts of the Jewish quarter. So it would be nice to see how we can scale up this type of work. Next slide, please. We have also been using Blender in an exhibition at the Architectural Center of Amsterdam. Uh, that was all about the relationship between the city, um, how we managed to keep our feet dry, at least most of the time. We were able, the digital twin of Amsterdam, 3D Amsterdam, uh, to combine it with some historical archival sources. And we were combining Blender uh, and the work of the University of Jena with their pho photogrammetry tool to you know, show par uh, uh, buildings that were demolished. Next slide, please. Well, third way, um, a third source of 3D models is work that has been done, there is being done by, well, amateurs in the literal sin of the word, people that love their history, their, their region. And here you can see some famous Amsterdam buildings like the Royal Palace, the Hendrik de Keizer Stock Exchange, and parts of, again, the Jewish Quarter. And on the next slide, please, I will show you how we combine things. Yeah, you can just click four times, then we have the text. What we're trying to do is use the um, visualizations, the 4D Research Lab, my colleagues have um, made in 2020. This is in a neighborhood that doesn't exist anymore, uh, but what we try to do is to uh, well, relive this, this neighborhood and combine archival sources from various archives, as you can see on the next slide, please. So we use uh, house cards, uh, market cards, wiki data, um, uh, diaries, collection of the Jewish Museum to well, really get back to this period and combine it with th uh, 3D. Next slide, please. So here you can see this visualization again, and uh, every house you see here is connected to plots with a geolocation. And this way we will be able to use an individual house as a portal to the archival sources I just showed you. But as this project was one of the biggest challenges of the 4D lab so far, we are also looking into faster ways of visualizing the past, which I'll show you on the next slide. My colleague Chiara Piccoli already tested the City Engine software on 16th century Amsterdam, which you can see here. And now we will be applying this technique to streets in the Jewish Quarter that have not been visualized so far. So it gives us a grayscale model that can be detailed uh, by other people in the near future. Again, another piece in the big jigsaw puzzle, the history of Amsterdam is. Next and last slide, please. Well, a little bit about a roadmap, but we can talk about it uh, later on. Uh, well, with our infrastructure, we'll be able to build applications and 3D. Well, 3D models are both important data sources and a way to really immerse the public in our shared histories. So thank you so much. Great, thank you. I'm glad that my menacing presence when I stand up makes people stop. So thank you so much. Um, we can uh, go to the panel discussion now. I hope you have a bunch of questions. I know that I am brimming with questions. Sadly, I'm mostly not the one that will be able to ask them. So Valentin, thank you for joining me on stage. Um, and let's make this into a hybrid online slash physical panel for the next uh, half hour or so. Uh, Valentin, I'll uh, invite you to uh, start this panel off.
I feel like now I'm the one missing out because they are having a, a party over there online and I'm alone here. Um, yeah, is this? Yeah, it's working. Um, yeah, so in this panel, the idea was to uh, explore a bit, um, to talk a bit, a bit um, more about the, the needs in terms of capacity building around, around 3D. So the first question I have for, the, for our panelists is, um, yeah, based on your experience, uh, what are the most important aspects uh, in uh, building capacity around, uh, around 3D? So maybe Kate, uh, do you want to share with us your, your remarks on this question? Um, well, I was planning to focus on the people um, because we have a situation where um, we want to build the capacity up, we want to have a sustainable approach, so we need a kind of common framework for people's um, practice in how they create and um, manage and store um, 3D uh, data. Um, so that it's um, going to be around for a while. I mean, I've been working with, with, with 3D for kind of 20 years now. And this is quite, quite a long time uh, for a fast moving industry where we see uh, very rapid developments in, in software. We see end products which kind of appear and disappear. What we need is longevity because we have um, if we want to use this data for uh, conservation reasons, we need to be able to go back and look at the condition of a building when it was captured 20 years ago, and then again 20 years in, into the future. So we need to have a, a good framework of understanding, and that means a good framework in terms of skilling people up so that they're creating things in a way which makes it possible to store the data, possible for someone else to come along and reuse it. Um, and I'd say these are my major concerns, is establishing that kind of common framework for education around 3D. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> bridging on this, uh, this idea of uh, yeah, scaling up and, uh, and, get, uh, and get people uh, up to speed. So Antonella, when it comes to a cultural heritage institution, what do you think are the, the most crucial aspect of, uh, of capacity building we, we need to, to develop around 3D? Well, I think first of all that often when we think about the capacity building, we refer to knowledge, to education, but uh, I'm convinced that there is another level of capacity that needs urgently to be addressed, in particular for 3D content, 3D cultural heritage, that is the infrastructure level. Because without a shared infrastructure where also the small institutions can deliver their data, uh, everything that we discuss uh, is not uh, scalable. So infrastructure as well as education and knowledge. And then there is a third level where uh, Europeana is uh, helping a lot, that is uh, to share good practices, uh, uh, lessons learned, to meet with the people, uh, to have an agora of uh, dialogue. So I think that the capacity should be articulated on these three levels with an harmonization of the three levels without the one uh, being the first and the other neglected. And now I think that the most of the attention should be on the e-infrastructure level, where, by the way, it, the long term digital preservation needs to be addressed because long term digital preservation needs infrastructure where this preservation is taking place. Thank you, Antonella. Um, so maybe now, um, Baudevine, if you could reflect. So you are working with, uh, with students that are 
learning about uh, how to develop, um, yeah, to use 3D as an approach uh, for their for their research. And on the other hand, you are working on the on the materials that are, yeah, historical. Let's say so. What are the the key aspects uh, for you? Um, yeah, about capacity building, I think we, are, we, we will have to look for capacity building within our own institutions, within our partner institutions, the, the, the GLAMs. But we might also look into working more too closely together with uh, the, the digital twins. And I, there was a question in the, in, the, in the previous session, and I think this gentleman talked about the difference between the digital twin and the heritage twin. And that's, I think that's a good observation because digital twin is very focused on well, hard data and we want to, um, uh, to add, of course, from the, from the uh, humanities aspect also, let's say the softer salient data. So if we can use a little bit the money and the time and the efforts of putting into digital twin and let them, uh, let's say, work together with us, um, then we can really scale up our own work as well. Yeah. And uh, lastly, Nicolo, since uh, yeah, I, I grasp from your presentation that what you want is really also for 3D to become a new source for, for research. So I was wondering yeah, if you base also on this, uh, this distinction, a digital twin, uh, um, yeah, if you, if you have uh, something to, to complement this. Yeah, well, uh, you know, concerning the digital twin, we in archaeology is not applicable simply because we don't have sufficient information for recreating what would be, you know, we work very well in other subjects, probably modern architecture or things. But I agree with uh, Marinus when he actually mentioned the fact it's more a memories twin in a sense, or so it's only partial. Um, when it's about building capacity, this means a very broad set of definitions, as Antonella was, was saying before. In my opinion, there is a huge gap between what 3D visualization offers and actually our capacity to get this offer. And this is what Kate was saying. It's very interesting. I mean, it's changed a lot in 20 years, but in the last year, it's been very, very rapid. So I believe very much in bottom-up approaches. So I believe we must empower the users with tools to engage and experiment with 3D models. So actually simply rotating uh, a qualitative 3D model is not enough. So we really need to, you know, let this offer or possibilities more, uh, get more into the different users. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, moving on a bit. So um, I have a, a second question for you. So. Today we had a we had a, a lot of discussion where we have seen that the resource we put in a, in doing 3D digi digitization also um, has have an impact on the quality of the 3D you will obtain and possibly how it's going to be reused and the impact on reuse. So it seems there there is a, an interesting balance between how much effort you should spend and by effort i mean time but also money in creating the the, the 3d model and also the quality you you will obtain so uh, for the panelists how can how how do you think we can achieve a good balance so that uh, we can also accelerate uh, our effort without um, hitting a wall, trying to achieve the best of the best, but also maybe uh, over, um, yeah, using a bit too much uh, too much resources. So, Nicolo, do you have an idea on, on this? Uh, you are you are muted. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so. Quality, I believe, is a property that goes very much beyond the technical aspect of a digital object. I think we achieve quality and then increase reuse when our digital objects function as boundary objects, meaning when they are capable of embedding or incorporating different meanings in different words. And here I'm referring very much to Star and Green's art seminal article about object in museums. So that's, I think, it's very important. The quality definition of quality must be embraced in a much broader way. It's not just the technical characteristic of a model, which, you know, I don't think it's enough. 
I see Kate smiling. So Kate, do, do you want to, to go on on, the, on this question? There are so many aspects of quality, um, but yes, the technical quality is not enough. I mean, obviously, um, the, there are many aspects in terms of making connections between um, your uh, 3D representation and what else is known um, about that object, whether it's a, a verbal account, a, a living person, or a, a documentary source. So there are a lot of aspects um, of capturing the tangible and intangible aspects of, of any given monument or his uh, cultural heritage object. Um, and also there's the other dimension about quality. And I think Rahana began this morning by saying that, you know, sometimes you have to do what you can. Um, there are a lot of time pressures and uh, limitations around what is possible to digitize. You know, if you have access uh, to a site which is almost impossible to get to and you only happen to have your mobile phone with you, then that is going to be the best quality you can get at that particular moment because it could be that there's, you know, a storm brewing and you, you can never get back uh, to that monument. We've seen situations in Ukraine where, where um, there's devastation that happens almost overnight. So you can't always uh, plan to do uh, very highly detailed or to have the luxury of two weeks access to get uh, the best uh, metrical quality to your your um, your record. You, you have to balance things out. Antonella, so in your work around the Eureka 3D and, and the building of the infrastructure to, to support cultural heritage institution in, in doing more 3D. So what are yeah uh, what are the considerations you are making in indeed achieving this good balance between the amount of efforts you are going to invest and also what you will achieve uh, at the end yeah i, I guess that this is a, a crucial question a very a very crucial point because we need to accelerate but we need also to have the highest possible quality as it was mentioned by Caterina but we also have to take into account the purpose the scope of what we are digitizing so there are there is a, a an intricate uh, um, set of uh, reasoning that uh, should bring uh, to uh, a decision. And uh, so this is uh, complicated. I don't think that there is a unique uh, answer. I want to mention something that happened in the 90s in Italy, uh, even the 80s. Digitization, we need to digitize uh, uh, our cultural heritage. And uh, the Italian Ministry of Culture at the time did a big investment, a huge investment never seen in culture, to take pictures of uh, cultural objects. You know, uh, it was uh, the early of what now we conceive as a digitization. So it was just to take pictures. Well, this big campaign was done in a low resolution, black and white. Wasted. Waste of money and waste of resources and waste of everything that was done. So the problem of looking ahead in terms of quality is fundamental because if we accelerate only to do 3D today with what we know in order to be as fast as possible, we risk to waste our resources. But at the same time, there is another question that is key. What to digitize? Are we going to digitize everything? Or there is a because of the cost that is involved in 3D digitization, there is the need for a reflection on what to digitize. We, heard, we read in, and we heard today in the summary of the recommendation that uh, the places that are most visited needs to be digitized. Is this uh, really the, the way to go ahead? We are not certain. 
Thank you. <laughs> a lot of things to, to reflect on. Uh, then uh, to, to close uh, about the vine, so for you, yeah, this, uh, this uh, balance between effort and, uh, and quality is probably something you have to address in, uh, as part of the work with your, your students. So what are, what are the, the criteria you are looking at? Well, if we regard uh, a 3D model as work in progress, let's say as a result of a process, then it, it's still, it, it will be on, ongoing. So what we are, uh, well, at the 4D lab are looking into and other researchers too is a, way, a standardized way of visualizing what you do and do not know yet. So in fact, you could look at a, a, a color scheme or use of, of uh, indications to show how certain you are of things, and uh, if you, if you do so, yeah, you you can um, well work towards well whatever definition of quality, but you can move forward with the models you you are are working on um, in a community. Thank you. So yeah, I can see that Katerina would like to 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 say something. So uh, we are going to move soon to the the Q and A, so that there is a bit of time for also taking uh, taking uh, questions from the the floor. So I will just ask uh, for you for to in in a very yeah in thirty seconds to kind of maybe. Tell me um, a highlight of this discussion with this, the, within this panel or something you have heard today. What has really struck your, your mind? So, Baudevine, go, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think a lady from the public talked about this uh, three aspects, standards, storage and cooperation. And I, th uh, I think I fully agree. We have to be working together within our network, together with the European uh, on shared standards. And share practices and uh, well showcase what we're doing. Yeah. Kate, on your side. I don't think I'm ready to ask you, <laughs> fun team. Um, I mean, I wanted to emphasize the importance of documentation, really, and it's not something I've heard anyone say today, but we've, we've spoken a bit about standards, but um, one of the issues that we always have with 3D is lack of good metadata and provenance data and documentation for that content. And um, it's all very well capturing 3D, but you can't reuse it without documentation. So one of the challenges for the future actually is, is maybe being a bit smarter in terms of using the technology to actually have a, an integrated workflow for capturing documentation around 3D content as it's generated and processed and um, versioned. Um, Thank you. Which is nothing that's mentioned today, so I'm sorry for that. Uh, Nicolo, in 30 seconds, really quick. <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course, I, I agree with all your previous statement, and I also think that we need to socialize more with these new media in practical terms and from the perspective of higher, higher education and research, I think we need to include more and more 3D model in our current teaching and research. So we need to be getting used to this and use this in our everyday activities in cultural education. Yep. And finally, Antonella, also very quick. I, I guess that our next challenge is to have access to culture to the digital cultural heritage as a continuum of experiences uh, and contents without uh, gaps uh, and interruptions uh, and the jumps uh, from uh, one place to another, a continuum of experience uh, in the digital world for cultural heritage as uh, we have in the physical world. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, let's move to maybe how much time we have for some... We have about five minutes for questions, so maybe yeah. let's have some questions in the room if there are any fiery questions okay. that you really want to ask now, Katerina, no longer, or? Yeah, the, the mic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So actually, it's a comment. Uh, first of all, I think uh, today's event has been very inspiring, and uh, for me uh, as well, uh, I've learned a lot of things. The comment was, I want everybody to live with, um, without uh, maybe some doubts about what those targets in the recommendation are. So I think, as I said, there are the digitization targets, and then there's the um, targets for uh, content on, on the data space and on Europeana. And as, as regards the digitization targets, 
we ask member states to set those goals in their digitization digital prevention strategies after reflecting on what uh, they consider important to, to digitize uh, in terms of cultural heritage at risk and in terms of uh, most uh, visited monuments and sites and also the under digitized domains as well. So it doesn't, if a member state decide that at this stage they consider like, I don't know, 50 monuments uh, or sites at risk and they set this as their goal for the strategy, then the percentage of 100% or 50% applies to that. And the same for the most visited monuments and sites that the member states consider important uh, to uh, digitize in 3D, uh, not only for preservation papers, but also to increase uh, engagement and reuse in, in other um, in other uh, cases as, as we discussed. So again, it is up to the strategy at the member states level or even at the institutions level. Um, so it's up to them to set that goal. And then the percentages for the targets apply to the goal cho goals chosen uh, by the member state and the, uh, uh, or the organization. So I hope this is clear. I tried to make that, maybe I did not make that clear enough in, in my presentation. But I think it's important to, to clarify. Uh, so, so thanks very much for that. Thanks, I think that's a very good clarification. May you explain uh, the reasoning for uh, uh, looking for the most visited places? Because this uh, um, is uh, not fully understood uh, by the people I have been in contact with. Yes. So. Uh, the most visited places also are those that are also of most interest uh, for visitors and we expect, well, A is the concerns for, for deterioration, but also uh, we, we expect that this will be uh, the, of most interest for, for use or for engagement. I don't know if that answers your question. Was that the question? Uh, Yes, it, and you answer it. Yeah. There is a double okay. reply. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Deterioration and uh, relevance. Thank you, Antonella. Anyone else from the panel who wants to pick in on this? Shall we move on? Yeah. We have another question that we'll go to instead. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, Mike here again. Um, I have a question uh, for anyone on the panel or in the crowd. Um, they're talking about uh, quality in in 3d data capture do you think that um you should have minimum requirements for accuracy and resolution in this data capture for example is it like one millimeter or better or um in terms of if if you're specifying okay everyone needs to capture data of this accuracy or, or resolution is is that really uh i mean a laser scanner has a you know, it's difficult to force people to do it, but I think it, it's maybe an important aspect of these um, strategies. Thank you, Mike. So the question was, is there a minimum uh, standard for quality that you think is important? Nicolo? Yeah, well, no, I don't think so. I don't think it's, it's actually something that you can ask because the, the fact is that it depends very much which kind of instruments, which kind of situations and many things. The question is, rather than having um, a quality in resolution, it is probably as Kate was pointing out before, having a quality of documentation of the data you have. For example, uh, before Antonella was mentioning the fact that there's been a lot of digitization campaign in the past. This is true and in that case was a negative experience, but technically speaking, what actually has been acquired five years ago with laser scanning. Today, according with this requirement you're opposing, will be unacceptable. The reality is that those data are actually very useful because eventually they do not exist any longer or has actually been acquired by people which had put extra careful in highlighting specific aspects that today eventually for conservation issue everything is no longer possible. So I think, um, you know, in research, talking from a research perspective, there is the paradata part which is as far as actually you inform the users what are the limits and the potential of your data set, you are on the same site. Actually, if you have a super high resolution 3D model, which doesn't possess any information about how it's been created and everything, this cannot be used at any possible way. 
no researcher will use it because you need to know how it was created, how it was processed and everything. So I would say rather than requirements on the resolution or the minimal requirement, I would say there should be a requirement on informing the users on what are the limits and potential of the model you are posting or you are making available with metadata and paradata. That was my perspective. Great, thank you, Nicolo. If there is one other uh, <laughs> reaction from the panel, or if not, uh, I will close it now. Let's give our four panelists a hand. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Yes, this is wrong. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank you for all the support you've given us uh, and the ministry of, uh, in general. I think this was a very fruitful collaboration. I agree with Jolan, this was an incredibly rich day uh, also for me uh, to learn about all these different aspects. Uh, so that's fantastic, thank you. And uh, the Heritage Board, of course, and uh, the Museum of Ethnography and World Cultures. Fantastic. Thank you for hosting us. I'd like to have an applause for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also like to thank all of our speakers. They were fantastic. And uh, the audience, also the people online, of course, uh, you've been very patient with us when we had our uh, Fika coffee breaks. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did here in the room. Uh, I'd like to, indeed, like you, uh, end with uh, a couple of notes. You can join uh, the European Network Association. Uh, you'll be joining a group of 4,000 professionals like us uh, who are interested in the same kinds of subjects. So go to pro.europeana.eu, uh, especially if you're from Sweden. Uh, Eva, we've got a new target here, I think. Yeah? <laughs> Very good. Um, so. Maybe some final remarks. I really liked uh, the very practical approach uh, we've, get, we've been given by, uh, by this guy, Mateusz, uh, and that stuck with me. So sort of, what are the three things? What are the three things we can start with? And, and for me, I always like the mantra of when we talk about topics like this, uh, think big, start small, and act now. Uh, so the Think Big was the inspiration we've got from, from many people, many speakers. Uh, Marinos, uh, you were the first who brought a, uh, uh, a 3D digital object into Europeana, and you are the most digitized, uh, the most uh, redigitized uh, object in Europeana. Every five years, you said, you need to redigitize that. And I think that's also a lesson that we can learn. Um, the thing big is also for me that uh, 3D is really relevant, uh, also for people who are in the 2D world mostly, libraries and archives, because if we stretch our imagination a bit beyond the today and tomorrow, uh, what are the kinds of platforms that we want to be visible and uh, in and operating on in the next five to 10 years, right? So those targets that we've heard about in 2030, we need to imagine that completely new ways of interacting with digital culture heritage will be possible by then. And that's just a reality that we need to start getting a grip on. Uh, the metaverse, uh, mirror worlds, the world will be 3D, uh, including the digital world. I imagine a world where this whole building will be machine readable and we'll have a digital layer, a digital twin around it uh, at some point. Interestingly, we haven't talked a lot about AI and the role of AI in, in this whole process. Uh, so maybe that's something that we can take to the next presidency. Think big, start small. I love Jill Cousins' presentation. Uh, for 20,000 euros and volunteers, you can get started. And that may still be, for some museums, libraries, and archives, a big investment. I think we should also be, be realistic about that. But the more we can pool resources, the more we can work together, I think the more this will become a possibility for everyone. And the act now means that um, we can hand over the presidency as far as we are concerned, or of course, as far as Sweden is concerned, to uh, the Spanish presidency and later on to the Belgian presidency is also here in the room. And we'll, we'll be talking to you later. So Jolan, um, maybe you want to introduce our final speaker. And thank you, everyone, for being here. It was a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hari and Eva. Harry has done the introduction for me perfectly. Of course, this is part of the Swedish presidency event. Um, these presidencies change every six months. So we are looking forward to the next stop on our presidency tour, which is Spain. Uh, Laura Guindal, who is a head of library project at the Spanish Ministry of Culture and Sports, will introduce the Spanish presidency for us. Laura. not to be able to be with you today in person, but I didn't want to miss the opportunity to address a few words to you, even if it's on a delayed basis. For Spain, it is a source of pride to pick up the button of the European presidency from our Swedish neighbors and to continue on the path of building the new common European data space for cultural heritage. 
That is why we invite you in October to the hybrid event that will be organized jointly by the Spanish Ministry of Culture and Europeana and that will take place in Pamplona. In this event, we will continue talking about 3D and defining this new cultural data space that interconnected with the rest of the data spaces will save the new Europe. From Spain, we want to take advantage of the six month presidency to put culture at the forefront of public policies as a means of promoting health, equality, economic growth, sustainable communities, etc. Thus, among the main lines we have for the presidency are to have culture as a global public good and so promoting a culture specific SDG. Also, we want to support cultural industries to raise a political debate on the need to improve the working, social security and tax conditions of artists, creators and cultural professionals. We want to boost the sustainable management of cultural heritage, its universal accessibility and its role in a structure in the territory. And last, we aim to promote the audiovisual and digital culture of the video game sector in Europe. We are at a time of transformation and opportunities and from Spain, we want to foster community dialogue to build a future of Europe together. Greetings and see you in a few months in Pamplona. Thank you, Laura, and indeed I hope to see all of you in Pamplona as well. I'd like to close by again thanking the Swedish National Heritage Board for making all of this possible. Uh, most importantly, I do want to name Lisa Berg, Maria Rossipal, Björn Sundberg and Erik Fugelang for their great work, so please give them a hand as well. Uh, the last thing I'll say before I let you go is that I also want to thank all of my colleagues at Europeana who helped make this event happen. They have worked tirelessly behind the scenes to set all of this up, to uh, you know, make everything work as smoothly as possible. So thank you to Hina, Tamara, Valentin, Shadi, Sebastian, Hari, uh, people back in The Hague, people online that are helping us. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, let's give them one last round of applause and let's go see an exhibition. Thank you so much.